Hi. I will present you an exercise which is uh, recently developed out of the Superscala uh, software. So, a little bit of background first is that I'm mostly active on Spinal HDL, which is a hardware description library for Scala. The XS5, which is, um, you know, the soft core. And next is which is the subject of this talk. And my background is both software and hardware. So I will mix really a bit uh, both world during this presentation. So next is it is a 32-bit and 64-bit with 5 core with a few extensions like multiply, atomic, single precision floating point, double precision floating point, compressed instruction set, supervisor and user mode, which is more than enough to run Linux, uh, like for instance, uh, distribution like build root and so on. And it is also enough to run, just enough to run Debian. So I'm currently working on that. Hopefully it will work uh, in less than one month. So, and one of the main attributes of this core is that it is not implemented in the Excel in our system very well. And instead, it uses uh, software. Um, software like it uses a general purpose programming language, like let's say it's like C or Python or Java. In the case of Nexus 5, it is Scala. So it uses Scala to elaborate the hardware and to build abstractions layer. And so you can find all the source code there uh, if you want to. And here is a, for instance, an example of the car running Doom in Linux in a reverse engineered oscilloscope at a quite decent frame rate of about 75 uh, frames per second, which is quite good for the platform it is on. So I didn't need that part. Somebody else did it. You can find some information here. And so I will mean, not go too deep in the architecture, uh, but I will give a few insights to to get some feeling how this kind of core could work. So uh, let's start by saying, okay, in the core there is two decoder, which means the core when it fetch instructions, it can read up to two instructions per cycle to push them further in the pipeline. Uh, three issue, which is how many instructions can start execution each cycle. Uh, and to do those three issue, there is three pipelines. One uh, shared execution unit here, which does things like address uh, generation unit for the load and store, multiply, divide, control status register to manage things like exception, uh, interrupt, uh, virtual memory, and this kind of things, and a few other specific instructions. And so this is a, a viable latency pipeline. And there is also two fixed latency pipelines which, which have a better latency, a faster wake up of depending uh, instructions. And those two pipelines are equivalent, and they can do things like um, add, sub, shift, jump, and range instructions. So, in the core, there is a concept of a physical register in opposition to architectural register. So, by, by architectural, architectural register, I mean that, for instance, when you write some assembly code, you will make reference to some register like add x1 and x2 and put that in the register x3. So those are architecture register. And here in the core, I have more registers than this. So we have what we name physical register, which mostly allow the execution to go uh, much further, to, to not having to wait um, in many cases that the previous instructions are done. Kind of allow to decouple uh, the instruction stream in a few cases. There is um, a reorder buffer, which is mostly something used to store uh, the context of the instructions in the pipeline. And so with 64 entry, you could have up to 64 instructions in flight in the pipeline. There is some branch prediction. I will, I will comment that uh, in the next slide. Um, 
um, quite important to have a, a good brand product plan because uh, this product functionality is quite high, it's about 10 cycles. If you compare that to uh, another car, it's about double the penalty, plus the fact that you, you lose all the things you already did in advance because you are in out of other cars or you may track a lot of a lot of useful work. Uh, there is a notion of having a non-blocking data cache, which means that if you access some memory which is not in the cache, okay, it will it will uh, go to read that memory and fill the cache uh, with it, but it will not block the whole system. It will allow allow the system to do a few, um, other access to the memory meanwhile. And so, yeah. I will just talk a bit about the branch prediction because it is a kind of an interesting topic. Not not saying that it is any anything run groundbreaking in Nexus Five. I would say it's pretty standard. Um, but it is an interest, interesting thing still. So the branch prediction is done in multiple layer. The first layer is done in the fetch stage. So it's very early in the pipeline. And so the thing here is that <coughs> we don't have a lot of information to predict where the CPU should go next. We don't know the instruction we're executing yet because we are currently accessing the instruction cache in parallel. And <coughs> we don't know the data. For instance, if you have a branch if equals, we don't have access to the, we don't know the, the values that we have to compare to know if we have to branch or not. So, we have to make prediction for those two things. And so, in the case of NAX, uh, we predict which kind of instruction is in the world we fetch with the BTB. So, for instance, if you tell us, okay, um, because we still have a few information here, we know which uh, address we are fetching, and we know as well the history of the last branches, like we know the history of the last 10 branches, if they branched or not. And so with those two information, uh, we can print a few things. Like, okay, maybe it is likely that the instruction at that given world is uh, branch if equals. And we also have to predict where this branch if equals uh, would branch if we take it. So. Okay, first part of the prediction. And the second part of the prediction is done by Zichair, which is saying, okay, um, that branch in that world is very likely or not to branch, for instance. So it's a data prediction. So that's the first layer, which uh, we have a really fast response time. And then we have a second layer, which is then in the decode stage. And at that stage, we have a few more information. We, at that stage, we know exactly uh, the instruction that we are executing. We don't know the data yet, but we know, but we know the instruction, which allows us, uh, for instance, if the BTB here told us there is no branch in that world, here, in the decode stage, second layer, we can correct that eventually, if there is really a branch and told us before there is none. So we can correct a few things. Uh, we can also do some uh, better data prediction in the case of um, call, function call and function return. For instance, uh, return address stack is a stack structure in the hardware. When we do a call, we pack something on it. And when we do a return from function, we pop something out of it. So that's the kind of improvement we can do here, and using that to do some production. And, and then, finally, for instance, in our execution unit, the job here is not to execute the branch, but it's more like to check. Because at that moment, we have everything you need. We, know, we have the instruction, we have the data. So at that moment, the job is to control to check that the previous prediction did the job correctly and if not the case, correct them. And finally then, when we commit the branch, commit means like uh, we, we, are the, we can apply the side effect of the branch, at that moment uh, we can learn. So there is kind of a, a loop 
allowing the brand management to, to learn from their mistake, for instance. And so, coming back to, the, to a more general view, abstraction doesn't mean overhead. Um, in the case of TCPU, it got quite some decent performance. Uh, keep in mind, it is, it is mostly made to be a software. And so it tried to fit well in a FPGA. And for instance, in a RTX 7, it, quite, it, it get quite close to uh, in order soft core frequency. Still quite more resource usage, but it's not too much for, for, for that big design. And so now let, let's dive a little bit into how, the, how you can generate the CPU, how the generation of the CPU is made. So, okay, you can go in the terminal, run this command line, then it will invoke the Naxxis 5 elaboration. It is based on Scala as a general proposed programming language for the hardware elaboration. Spinal HDL, which is, as I said, a Scala hardware description li library. And so this allows us to generate some VHDL and Verilog that we can then run some simulation and synthesis with the uh, flow uh, you are used to. And on the top of Scala and Spinal HDL, quite a few abstractions that I will now focus on the next slide. And so uh, Scala, it is a general purpose programming language, and here is an example how to write a hello world with it. So yeah, okay, nothing fancy. And okay, if you want to generate some very log file out of it, you could uh, use the file API of the language, uh, like okay, opening a new file, writing stuff in it, string by string. But that's really not what we want to do because this is this is horrible to do. And here is an example of the Spinal HDL API where you can, for instance, import uh, the core, Spinal core, write a Scala main in which you invoke Spinal HDL to generate some Verilog of a given module. And then, okay, let's say we define A and B as input unsigned 8 bits and result as an output uh, with the value a to this b. And this will generate this uh, very long net list. And so, okay, um, let's try to, to, let's look at this example, which is um, showing a bit the interaction between Scala and Spinal HDL. Because cool seems a bit weird to write this like that, why not directly writing uh, the very log uh, format? And so, yeah, here I will, I will show a bit the synergy between Scala and, and uh, Spanish HDL. So, okay, let's define A, B, C as output side 8 bits. Okay, let's then define array as an array buffer of few So, array buffer is a Scala thing. It's a mutable collection in Scala. And so you can store a reference to hardware signals of the netlist, like this, like, okay, you add A, B, C in our array. Then write, for instance, a for loop, which will iterate over all the elements of our array. And we will assign each of them to zero. And, and how you can see uh, here, the generated netlist will be kind of uh, unruled. Um, because Spinal HDL will only see the, the part of its API. Basically, Spinal HDL is not a compiler. Spinal HDL is it's the concept of having an internal domain-specific language, and it will register all the, car, all the call to its API you do. For instance, uh, you will see, okay, uh, here he wants a new module, okay, he will add it into the netlist. You will see here, okay, he wants uh, output unsigned, he will add them, and he will not see this array buffer because it is a Scala thing. He will not see the for loop, it's also a pure Scala thing, but he will see the side effect of those things, like, okay, here, it's assigning element with zero, and he will generate this. 
So that's really the concept. Uh, you could use things like uh, hash map, dictionaries, uh, all sorts of data structures that you want to elaborate the hardware. And so, coming back to Nexus 5, um, if you look at the design, there is a lot of pipeline, a bit everywhere. For instance, okay, there is one pipeline to fetch, one pipeline to decode, allocate, rename, and dispatch instructions, uh, one pipeline for each execution unit, and quite a few pipelines in the load and store unit, like one for the load, one to manage the address of the store, one to manage the data of the store. Once uh, those two things completed, there is another pipeline to, to apply some side effect and another pipeline to finally write back the data. I mean, yeah, there is a lot of pipeline, which is, which is maybe okay to write by hand if you, if you don't have to optimize a lot, if you, are, if you are really pretty sure of where you need to do what. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that I would say kind of never the case. Uh, you always need to optimize things to move uh, where in the pipeline you do some operations. And as of quite often here, those pipelines are composed with multiple uh, things in running in parallel. So you need to compose those pipelines with different things. And so what was done is a pipelining API uh, implemented on the top of Scala and Spinal XDL, where, for instance, here we define a module with A and B as input and signed, result as an output and signed. And then uh, we use our API to create a new pipeline and a few states like A, B, and C. So the states will be collected in the same order they are defined and with this connection type. Um, this M2 has been connecting things with a register. So there, is, there will be, there, there is also other connections like uh, instead of a register, use a queue, or maybe uh, directly connect wires from stage to stage, um, as you want. And then, okay, we come here, we okay, and we say, in stage A, insert the value A plus B. And this will uh, provide us some but sum is not a signal, sum is a key allowing to retrieve this result along the whole pipeline. So we can go in stage C and ask um, the hardware value of representing the sum key and assign that to result. And then once we specified everything we need, we say, okay, pipeline, build yourself. And there you go. Um, the thing is how it works internally, because here we have this build function. So how this kind of function is defined is, okay, pipeline is a class, um, and in this class, we have a list of stage, so a elaboration time list, and we have a build function. And t what we'll do what, what will be done in this build function is like, for instance, we'll iterate over every stages, figure out what they need, uh, where the things they need is generated, and generate the hardware required to connect all those things together. And for instance, what is a stage? Okay, it is a class. And here, we have uh, a hash map, like a, a dictionary, which will allow the stage uh, to link a given key, like the sum key we had before, to its hardware representation in that stage. So yeah, we are using an hash map to elaborate the hardware we need. And so back a bit to Nexus 5 now, um, just a few, for instance, if you want to instantiate the CPU, you have a single parameter, which is a list of plugins. And this list of plugins, okay, it's a uh, Scala array buffer, so elaboration time list of plugin. And in this plugin list, we will add like a plugin to manage the program counter, one to, to, to fetch uh, instructions, one to decode, one to dispatch, commit, and quite a few others. And so those plugins, they are not uh, on off switches. So one concept in Nexus 5 was to 
avoid having a big bloated top level where everything has to connect with everything it needs and at, as soon you need to add something you need to, you need to go in the spaghetti uh, mess to add a, a few modules a few connections and uh, it's really horrible so the concept in Naxi 5 is really instead to use this list of plugins if you look at the top level Naxi 5 here it's, it's mostly empty it's just a few lines and do not generate any hardware by itself but instead um, each of those plugin contain and define the hardware which need to be added to the netlist. And it also defines some negotiation with all the plugin to, to ask resources. I, I will comment that later in the next slide. So which makes things really flexible, like if you want to add an execution unit, like a ELU0, you come and you add an execution unit base, which is a skeleton of pipeline uh, execution unit, and in, and then you can compose this skeleton with a few other plugins, which will uh, negotiate things with the execution unit base to implement their behavior, like adding add some instructions, adding shift instructions, branch instructions, and so on. And like, if you want to add a second execution unit to to uh, to go faster with CPU, you just come and add another set of plugins with uh, another key, like ELU one, and yeah, things will compose themselves. And so, okay, let let's try to look a bit what is a plugin. So, it is a class. Okay, in the case in the case of branch plugin, we will use the branch plugin for the next slide. Uh, we need to know on which execution unit uh, we need to, to work on. So our uh, construction parameter. And this class extends the plugin base class. So we have the concept of inheritance here, applied to hardware liberation, which allows us to define our early and a late uh, phase. So the early phase will be used to set up things like uh, we, we may ask to another plugin to provide us some interface. Um, and the later phase will be there to allow our plugin to generate some hardware. So, for instance, in the case of the branch plugin, uh, we need to do two things. We need to detect if there, is, if there is a mispredicted branch and correct it. And we also need to do an exception, a trap, in the CPU if the branch is misaligned. And so to do that, we need a schedule interface uh, to, to put the CPU back on track. And the way we can get this interface, so yeah, it, it's not to wire thing in the top level by hand, but it's more um, much more dynamic like than this. So we will uh, use some API uh, from the plugin base class, which is like uh, get the service which implement this software interface commit service. So commit interface uh, commit service is an abstract class, so a software interface, and we can retrieve in the list of all the plugins which one implements that software interface. Yeah, so like Kev has the base class service, a ba base class service, uh, each plugin is a service, uh, and there is a commit service, which is another service, and you have the commit plugin, which is a plugin, and implement the commit service interface. So we really have a class here key um, for our hardware elaboration. And once we obtain uh, a reference to this commit service, we can ask him via the new schedule port function to, to provide us a new hardware interface for our own usage to put the CPU back on track. Uh, and we ask the interface to be capable to uh, jump and crap. So yeah, that's, that's the negotiation phase, for instance. And then the logic phase, then we generate a proper hardware to drive this interface with, uh, yeah, depending on the condition we detected, and yeah, we generate the netlist required to drive it. So, um, instruction requirements. So, there, there was also the idea in the CPU that you could add its instructions easily in the pipeline without modifying uh, 10 files there and there and there. And so, for instance, in the case of the branch plugin, we need to specify that we will implement a branch uh, if equal instruction. So the way we do that is 
we specify uh, what is a branch equal instruction. So caret is a single depending, whatever that is. And with a given opcode. So here is the bit mask representing the instruction uh, branch equal. And a list of resources, like saying, okay, branch if equals uh, is using the integral register file, register source one and two. It need to read the program counter, and it need to read the site of the current instruction in byte. So yeah, here we, we define the instruction branch equal. And then what we can do is we can retrieve the execution unit base, which has the same execution unit IDs on us. So yeah, this is a bit the same pattern than before, but here we use a lambda function, like really a software thing to filter out, uh, because there may be multiple execution unit bases in the list of plugin. And there is a, a function that you can call to add, uh, to specify to execution unit that uh, a given instruction is implemented in its pipeline by somebody, us, in this case. And so this will have quite a few cascading effects. Like, one side effect it will have is the execution unit uh, will figure out that somebody needs to read, uh, needs the value of the integer of the file as one as two and need, needs the program counter. And so the execution unit uh, base will then add the hardware required to read those informations if it was not already made uh, to make them available for the branch plugin. So, and, and a few other side effects is like the execution unit base will then notify the ECQ and the dispatcher that uh, it can execute a branch if equals. So, yeah, the branch if equals instruction needs to find its way through the pipeline, through the multiple execution unit. That's how it is sorted out. Also, the decoder uh, will be notified that when it sees that bit pattern, um, it needs to read those two registers. So the dependency tracker um, will know about it, and eventually the register renaming system too. So there was also the concept of having composable pipeline. Mm. And here is an instance. For instance, the branch plugin uh, will need to calculate where the branch uh, has to go. And so, OK, to do that, he will retrieve the execution unit base with the same IDs on us, like in the slide. And then it will ask to the clean unit to provide the stage from the pipeline API, uh, which represents the execute stage zero. Like, you could, you could implement your branch plugin over multiple stages. And here, you, you, you ask the pipeline API representation of a given stage. And then you can use, for instance, the program counter key to access the value of the program counter key, which was inserted by the existing unit base uh, above in the pipeline and drive the schedule interface. And so, um, yeah, another thing is there, there was a few, a few issues with memory inferring. Is that in and out of the core and super scalar core, you kind of often need uh, memories with multiple read and write ports. So uh, one way to, 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 to define the memory in Spanish DL is that you can okay, define a RAM as being a memory filled with 256 word of a 16-bit event. Then you can create a few uh, write ports and a few read ports. But then um, the, the, yeah, the issue is that, I mean, it will work in simulation. It will work well in simulation, it will generate a uh, proper Verilog. But the issue is that, is that many synthesis tools to put the design on real hardware will not be capable to handle it. They may be capable to handle when you have multiple read ports, but multiple write ports, uh, it is tricky. So. The way how things are handled in Nexus 5 is the user can still implement memories like this in their pure way. And then um, there is some phase which will uh, walk all the statements defined so far. And it will retrieve. Because basically, yeah, in Spanish, when you define things like this, you will feed a netlist for computation. 
uh, internal representation of the netlist that you can still uh, visit. Like when you do some compiler techniques, things you have the concept of uh, visitor, uh, the concept of abstract syntax tree, AST, and here we are iterating over this tree, like saying, okay, in the current module, uh, work all the declarations done. Uh, if if you find one uh, for, for each one of the memory type, then execute this block of code. Of code. So here we have pattern matching, um, and yeah, you will get this in the terminal because it will, it will find this memory. And then what you can do is you can iterate over all the memory ports of given memory, like uh, to count how many write ports there is, how many read ports there is, and if you know that it will make issues, then you can modify the netlist. Like, okay, say memory dot remove statement. That will remove the memory from the netlist and you can replace it with something else. Like you with maybe a black box or maybe you will want to emulate a memory of this with this layout using uh, multiple simple dual ported memories with some live value table or maybe using some XOR uh, technique on the data to generate multiple write ports. I mean there is there is many solutions. And so for si about simulations, um, in general when we have to simulate things we have to go uh, to one of the big three uh, simulators. But in an uh, open source uh, ecosystem, it's, it's not possible for many reasons. Uh, licenses are really expensive. Uh, there may be a few ways you can get something uh, working without a paid license, but it's really, really slow and limited. So instead, um, Nexus 5 uses Verilator. So here is the full flow. Okay, where you can generate the hardware as we've seen before. Nexus 5, generation from Spain HDL, we get some Verilog. And the concept of Verilator is it is a tool. You give Verilator your synthetizable uh, Verilog and it will generate a C model, which is cycle accurate. It will only be able to translate synthetizable code, so it's, it, it works well in our use case. So. From that C++ model, uh, C++ test bench that we have to implement, and Spike, I will come uh, back on Spike in the next slide, we will compile all those guys together uh, with GCC, and we will get an executable which will be our simulator. And uh, for instance, here, uh, our simulator, we can execute it with a few arguments, like to load a given benchmark, like the right stone benchmark at given memory and it will execute in terminal. At a decent speed, uh, it depends on the configuration of the CPU, but you will get between 100,000 uh, 100, hertz, yeah, 100 kilowatts and 200 kilowatts of uh, cycles per real time second. And so, to speak a bit about Spike, so Spike, it is, I would say, the official risk five simulation tool. So you can provide Spike uh, a given binary and ask it to execute uh, one instruction after each other. And basically, it will be used in our test bench as a golden model of what the next risk five should do. So, and basically, it is. Yeah, it is used in a way to check that our CPU is is staying in check with uh, risk five specification. So in our benchmark, when our CPU Nexus Five commits something, uh, we will make Spike commit something and compare the result. Uh, so it's just a few, but it's still it's not like letting Nex uh, run and logging something letting Spike run and logging something and comparing the two full execution log. It's, it's really a lockstep way because 
for instance, when you have an interrupt uh, proposed to NAX coming from outside, you have an interrupt coming from the outside, NAX will not necessarily take that interrupt <coughs> uh, in a deterministic, deterministic manner. It really depends what it has to do. It may continue a little bit and then take the interrupt. And so for that reason, for instance, when NAX is five take an interrupt, that interrupt is then proposed to spike. So there is a few um, synchronization between the two models which are done like this to keep them uh, at the same execution, in the same execution flow. So as well, you can um, generate some traces, like um, in general, uh, people are using VCD trace in the open source world, but <coughs> with Virilator, more and more we can use FST trace, which are really compressed and we'll keep track of all the signals of uh, the CPU. So you really have the full view of the design with it. And you can also extract some interesting metrics, like for instance, how much, uh, how much the ECQ is full, how much the IQ is full, stock Q is full, uh, to see when there is some uh, misprediction, when the CPU is rescheduling to a new, to a new place. And you can also generate some GAM5 traces that you can visualize with Konota in a quite different manner. So this trace here is showing uh, the execution flow, which is the kind of executed when, when they are fetched in blue, uh, when they are decoded and renamed, when they are waiting in the issue queue uh, for dependencies, um, and in line, it is when they are being executed. And here you can see the out of order uh, execution in the core. Like for instance, <coughs> this instruction, even if it's uh, defined after this one, is executed before because dependencies were already, already available. So it's quite interesting to look in that uh, kind of graph to debug performances, to understand how the, the core work. And yeah, that's it. So um, here is a few links to the, with the doc, the GitHub repository. And the roadmap is yeah getting Debian tested, um, memory currency and multicore support. And eventually, why not try to target ASIC? because currently it's uh, mostly for soft core, but yeah, it could be interesting too. Also, yeah, thanks for Nelnet for the funding, and now I should be here for the question. Hi. Charles, can you hear me? Charles, hello. Okay, we're having some issue here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hello, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was unexpecting that, that I need to initiate a call. Anyways, so uh, for the audience, uh, this is Charles, who is the creator of the Next Risk Five and the Vest Risk Five, which, which is the very widely adopted software. And when the actual Risk Five software champion back in 2018, so we are here open for questions that anyone would like to know about his newly created uh, out of order Risk Five core. Yeah, we have a live one here. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, but it's interesting uh, uh, because from, uh, I, I know another uh, language like uh, Chiso and it's familiar uh, to your uh, uh, language, Spanish or HDL. And uh, uh, could you please uh, uh, have a comparison uh, from your perspective uh, uh, for those two tools? Uh, having um, having a comparison with what? Sorry. Uh, with uh, Chisel. Ah, with Chisel. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
mostly I would say uh, there is a lot of history behind it, uh, especially when Chisel was in the version two, two is the second version of Chisel. Now it, it's Chisel three, so things change a bit. But I would say that now mostly it is about strictness and lint linting. Um, Spinal XDL is a bit more like VXDL, uh, not letting you assign um, signal of different trees together. Um, there, there is these kind of things, I would say. As well, the, the rule where the names are handled is um, quite different. So overall, I would say a lot of little details. And one big details is that Spinal XDL integrate a library with all the, um, a, a large library, a much larger library than uh, Chisel uh, in the base language, like um, UART, um, SPY, a, a lot of peripherals uh, and buses are implemented in the core. That way, different people um, working with Spinal XDL will, will, can, can use the same uh, base. Thanks a lot. So basically, uh, Chiso is more like uh, just a power to language, and, and, and on, the, on the other hand, uh, the Spino HDL is equipped with many toolboxes and, and uh, a lot of simulation framework out there. So this is kind of a system Verilog uh, to the Verilog comparison. Do I, uh, do I say it correctly, or, <laughs> or do I misunderstand something? <laughs> I will not. I will not go to that extent because basically, um, Chisel and Spinal uh, share the same paradigm. Uh, just to be really clear, just really the, the implementation and the details are really different. That that provide a really different experience. Uh, for instance, Spinal HDL keep the whole um, abstract syntax tree of the netlist. He keep the whole netlist in memory, while Chisel uh, flush it really fast into the FER. RTL format to go further with the flow. And he has, for instance, quite a few side effect, effects, like um, <coughs> Spinal XDL can track much more precisely issues because um, he, he can, for, for each potential signal, he, he can keep the whole stack trace of the context in which the given signal was created. So it, it's really a collection of implementation details which can make quite a big difference at the end. Thanks a lot for your, your explanation. Uh, I think we would like you to send up a lot of questions or? Oh, oh okay. Uh, I'm also very interested about your spin HDL and uh, the, do you have, could you explain uh, how did you do the uh, body log uh, elaboration? Uh, the question about the log, what, what is it? Uh, Okay, uh, in Chiso, uh, we use the FIRTL uh, to elaborate the VLOG. Uh, in other words, uh, to generate the VLOG call. Uh, could you exp uh, is, uh, explain uh, how, how did you uh, do it? Uh, so, basically, Nicholas has... Ah, it goes... Yeah, 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 you go ahead, please. Yeah. Oh, um, so, yeah, the question is how it goes to VLOG, right? Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, it goes... Okay, when you, okay, just to go the full path. So when you use the Spinal API, it will fill an at least in memories. There will be a few transformation phase, a few check phase, and then it will go directly to Verilog or to VHDL. It goes directly to it. There is no intermediate file format. It, it, it will, uh, so basically the Spinal HDL is directly being translated into the synthesizable Verilog without the uh, FIRTL-like intermediate okay. right. is it's directly translated from mm -hmm. the high-level language to the, to the synthesizable Verilog. That's the paradigm using here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any live questions here? Okay. Uh, if uh, Still, I have some questions we'd like to ask. Uh, Charles, I'm wondering that uh, if I want to find you uh, in giving the funding to do another extension, uh, could you give me a rough amount of the the the, the budget? Because you know the Vexris file is very popular, and now you have the next Vexris file, and people are thinking that maybe they can donate money to you to implement some more complicated in extensions, such as the 
impact Cindy or the even the vector one. So I'm wondering, do you have any amount of uh, budget you would, you would like to receive to implement this kind of advanced extensions? So uh, ve vector one will be something quite complicated. Uh, I, I, I would hope to not think about it too much because it, it's really um, a big one. Uh, but but pack SCMD, uh, it, it's really hard to know how to tell. Uh, I guess, yeah, the, my main issue is time. Okay. <laughs> um, that, that's my main issue. Like, uh, I really have a hard time finding time. So I'm trying to focus on, on not too big extension. I see. So, like, well, like a okay. few custom instructions for, for a specific usage, yeah, that's, that's feasible. If it's really something too big, it really depends the moment and depending what I have on the hand. And then, if, if the project is for open source, I would say I'm, I'm mostly flexible on, on the amount. I, as soon as it is reasonable, I will not charge uh, consulting fees for something open source normally. I see. Thanks a lot for your uh, impressive answering. <laughs> um, do we have any questions here? Uh, if not, then oh, so, yeah, yeah, we have a live one. Oh, hello. Uh, I just curious about your low we are speculate larger strategy. Do you uh, fully support a uh, low store of order or just only low latent like a low catch heat prediction? Sorry, which kind of out of order are you asking for? Uh, do you fully support of order of memory instruction or only just support? Uh, low catch heat latency prediction. I have, I have issue understanding, so I will just try to repeat to be sure I'm right. So you are asking about the memory system, right, for the load and store? Uh, load store instruction. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, you 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 are you are yeah yeah the the, the question is right. You are you are repeating you are repeating it right. Okay. Okay. So okay. So the way the mm, the load and store uh, out of the ring works currently is that um, okay, load can be d done fully out of order. Okay. Um, store uh, will not block loads in any ways, and there is a store to load bypass, which is implemented. So the data cache is able to refill multiple lines at the same time. So the cache is non-blocking. So overall, the, 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 I would say the memory system is, is, is not bad in, in that regard. Th does that answer fully the question? OK, thanks. Yes, I think that uh, um, maybe there is also yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, maybe that uh, I will forward your. Could I could I uh, give him the email address from you that, or the the public one you published on the GitHub link? Maybe he will try to. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I will tell us send over the the content info for him to to for 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 it more deepen <laughs> asking. Yeah, and thank you a lot. Uh, we are having a session prior. I know it's very early for you, so good morning and goodbye. <laughs> Hi, 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 Matt. Uh, so we let me allow, allow me to introduce a little bit that the person here. Uh, this is Dr. Bomin Lee, who, who is the sorry, there's Hello. a kind of echo. Uh, so he's the lead. Uh, I, I would say the lead uh, of the Taiwanese uh, semiconductor education. So I'm inviting him to join us, and he will do some kind of live Q and A 
uh, after the, the the session. So yeah, and please go ahead uh, to to, pres uh, to share your screen, and we will without further ado, let's do your talk. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sorry I joined a bit late. Uh, that's that's perfectly. Okay, please go ahead, and if you, if it's okay with you, please go ahead. Okay. Um, so thanks very much for inviting me to do this presentation. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, there's a, a rich history in semiconductors um, around the around the world, but especially in your area. And now, of course, there's the um, the huge impact of all the fabrication that's going on there. Um, and I've only been involved in ASICs for the last couple of years, so I'm very new to this. Um, and I'll just introduce a little bit about myself right now. Um, I work for Yosis HQ, who you may know do uh, open source synthesis tools, and those tools are used in all the open source ASIC flows. Um, and uh, we also do formal verification tools, also open source. Uh, I have a course called the Zero Basic Course that aims to teach you everything you need to know to get so, your own chips made. Sorry for and interruption. I was in a so, so, so for interruption. Uh, uh, Dr. Po, Dr. Lee, could you uh, mute a little bit? There's a lot of echo from your end. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Matt, please go ahead. That's okay. I was wondering what that noise was. <laughs> Um, and uh, Chipflow, uh, which is a startup that is aiming to make the most of this uh, new oncoming open source semiconductor tools to help um, get more product companies making their own chips. Uh, so if you're interested to find out about any, any more of those, you can uh, check the links in the presentation. And I'll be sharing a link to this presentation uh, later on. So if there's anything, uh, I've got lots of links in the presentation. And if you want to do further research, then you can uh, use the presentation as a, a jumping off point. So just before I continue, uh, Ruinland, is the audio and the video everything OK? Uh, we, we cannot see your slides. Did you just disable it? Or, it will, if, or will, will you reshare it again? No, they should be shared. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So your slice is, is gone. <laughs> Can you reshare it or? Uh, sorry. <laughs> is that no? That's good. Is that is that working? Yeah, it's it's come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's here. It's here now. I will ping you to the. Okay. Uh, could you change lay change? Uh, 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 okay, I will do it from my end. I will change the layout so it will be on the. Okay. Great. So, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, if it stops sharing again, let me know because I aim to be sharing the screen for the whole presentation. I don't mean to turn it off. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Please go ahead. Good. Okay. Um, so let's take a quick review. So thanks for the amount of time that you've given me today. It's quite a lot of time. So um, I'm going to give a quick review of what has happened over the last two years in this space because things are changing very quickly. Um, and uh, I'm also going to give you a demo of the tools in action and show you the kinds of things that we're getting out of the tools. Um, so let's start off with the, uh, the quick review. So in 2020, uh, we had the uh, open source Sky130 PDK, which is for us, I know, is the world's first open source process design kit. And um, that's important for quite a few reasons. One makes it much easier for people to get involved without having to sign an NDA. So if you're doing educational work, that's a real key thing. Um, and the other thing that was announced was uh, having a free opportunity to make uh, your own chips. So I had actually just started playing around with some ASIC tools, a tool flow called Qflow. 
um, and I was, I was getting GBS, which is the file you need to send to the foundry. Um, but when I found out how much it was going to cost to make the chips, I thought this is probably not going to be something that I do much of. But when Google decided to pay for the uh, free shuttles, so there's a, a lottery system, uh, there's a shuttle that runs about once every quarter, and there's 40 slots on that shuttle. And if your design is open source, you can make an application. And I've applied to all six of the uh, shuttle opportunities, and my designs have been accepted on five out of those six. And I've had about um, 10 or 12 different chips made now. Um, my first uh, use of the open source, uh, open lane tools, I'll talk about a bit more about the tool flow uh, later, uh, made in July. I did a presentation in November, and we did a, I did my first tape out with a group of other people um, in December for NPW1. That was the first free shuttle opportunity. Um, in 2021, eFabulous, which is the company that provides engineering experience and helps us interface with the foundries and has done a lot of the work on uh, getting the open source PDK and the open source tools working together, uh, brought up one of their test chips. So that was good to see that things were looking like they were going as expected. And in May, they announced a commercial version of the uh, free shuttle. So that's $10,000 for 300 chips. Uh, then in June, we had the MPW2 uh, tape out date. In October, we got MPW1 silicon back, but due to some problems in the tool chain, which I'll mention a bit more later on, we thought that it was going to be a complete write off due to hold violations. So if you're into silicon, you'll know what that means and how scary that is, but if you don't, then I'll explain a bit more later. Um, November, December, we had MPW3 and 4 tape out. Uh, November, we also had Remoticon 2021. I finally got my own chips back from MPW1 in January, so it was a whole year for that uh, process. Ideally, things are going to go down to six months or so, but um, this first one took a long time because it was the first run through with the, the, PD, the first PDK and the new tools. MPW5 was March. MPW2 wafers came out in April, um, and MPW6 was in June, and we're expecting um, MPW7 in September, and there's more uh, foundries coming online and more PDKs coming online later this year. So that brings us up to the uh, present date. So I'm just going to give you a bit of information now about uh, my own first chip. So. Uh, this what this um, because when I first started with i I've done a bit of FPGA experience, um, but I wasn't really used to how much space we had available. So on these shuttles, it's 130 nanometers, which is uh, large. It's quite an old node, about 20 years old now. Uh, but 130 nanometers is still very very small, and we have 10 square millimeters in this uh, space here that we're allowed to use. And so I was finding that my designs were very small. So I did a collaboration with some other people, and we put uh, nine designs here, um, eight designs that have a kind of a function, and then uh, this big block at the bottom was a big multiplexer that can set each of the designs to be the one that is uh, controlling all the IOs. Uh, I've got lots more information about uh, MPW1 if you want to find out more on this link here. And like I said before, I'll be sharing the link to this presentation at the end of this talk. So we had these eight projects here by me and some uh, friends uh, and mucks. On the chip at the bottom part, this part here, we have um, a RISC-V processor and two kilobytes of SRAM. Um, and we have a bit of firmware here that can decide which design should be enabled. So uh, the MUX did work, as we found out that MPW my chips worked. Um, but there was a, quite a few problems I had, uh, largely because I was doing everything by hand, because um, it was the first time through, and we didn't have much time. And I was very worried about making some mistake that was going to render the whole chip useless. 
So I was very happy when the chips got back and I got all my designs working. It wasn't that straightforward because I mentioned that we had these hold violations, um, uh, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit uh, later on in the presentation. If you want to get more information about my MPW on designs, you can check this link. So I thought what technical talk would be complete without a demo. So what better way to uh, show this stuff than doing a demonstration? So I've got the, um, the tools installed on my computer here. Um, and uh, just turn on the environment. I have tools for lots of the different uh, shuttles on here, so I'm activating uh, the tools for the, the seventh shuttle with this command. Um, and we have this PDK here, uh, which is two gigabytes installed, and uh, it's now very, very quick to set up the PDK and the open lane ASIC tools. It takes about two minutes. Um, I'll give you more information about how to set that up later. Uh, and then we have this open lane directory, and inside there we have a design directory, and then in here we have um, a list of all the, the designs that kind of come as examples. Um, and I'm going to be using this one called Seven Segment Seconds, which is an extremely um, simple design. So it just uh, divides a 16 megahertz clock down into seconds. Um, then it uses a bit of sequential logic to count, and then a decoder with some asynchronous logic to decode that into a, a seven second display. Um, if you're used to Verilog, just the hardware description language I use, uh, this is extremely uh, simple and straightforward, but for people who aren't familiar with Verilog, I'll just give a very quick run through. Uh, Verilog is a way of describing hardware, so it looks like C, but it's not really C, and that can be quite confusing when you start off. We have this uh, definition of the ins and outs of the module, and telling it uh, that I want some registers which are kind of roughly comparable to variables, although these registers will be created as actual real hardware chains of flip-flops in the design rather than being uh, register spaces in a CPU, like if you're using a programming language. And then I have a, a sequential circuit here, which is triggered only on the clock, and it basically does the comparing, uh, counting up to 16 uh, million, and when it uh, rolls back over to zero, it adds one to a digit. So this is going to be creating two hardware adders uh, and some comparison circuitry and then take that number and put it out uh, through the seven segment decoder, which is asynchronous logic, which means that as soon as an input changes, the output so it's like a big collection of ands and ors and nots. And essentially, as this uh, decimal number comes in, it puts on the eight, the seven bit output, uh, the, the, the ones and zeros necess necessary to turn that number into a seven segment display. And I can uh, synthesize this and show you um, how Yosis will take that hardware description language and then turn it into a digital netlist. And this is essentially what gets sent into the open lane tools. So going back to open lane, this is one of the available tool flows that we have. It's currently probably the most popular one. It's the one that I know most about. We put our design in the beginning. Uh, we use Yosis to do the synthesis. Um, we do static timing analysis, which can measure how fast the circuit can run by looking at the, uh, the digital logic that is used to create that circuit. And we have a feedback loop here that we can do uh, some iterations on to get better timing if we need to. The current design for test is currently not implemented. Um, we come back through here. This, everything in this green section here is provided by um, Open Road, which is a set of applications that has been under development for 10 years or so, is funded by DARPA 
in the States and it's aiming to create a full open source ASIC flow. And they provide these floor planning and placement optimization and routing stages. Uh, then we do antenna diode insertions, um, which I won't talk much about, but is uh, important uh, in semiconductors to get a good yield. Um, within the semiconductor industry, there is a huge amount of depth. The supply chains are enormously long. The software is very complicated. The physics of how it all works is very complicated. So this, is, this whole talk and presentation is at a very high level, assuming not much um, knowledge. And so I could talk for, or experts could talk for hours and hours about any one of these points, and I'm just giving it a very brief high-level overview of this whole flow. Uh, then we do detailed routing, come back through here. We extract the whole circuit, including the resistances and the capacitances, capacitances of all the wires. And then we do another static timing analysis to see if where the cells have ended up and all the routing, how these wires are connected together, whether that's going to change the timing and mean that the design is going to work or work too slowly. And then we stream out the uh, GDS2 files, which are the files, if you've done circuit board design before, they're a bit like the Gerber files that you use to send to the factory. The only difference here is we've got about 40 or 50 layers that we send instead of a normal kind of four rate or 10 layers that we send to a, a PCB fab. Uh, you can get the tools downloaded from here. Uh, and I've also written a summary tool that I'm going to be using in this demo uh, here, which knows where all the locations of the intermediary files are. So let's run open lane now on these uh, tools, on this design. I'll come back up to open lane. It's provided as a, as a docker with all the tools installed, so I just uh, mounted the docker there. And then I'm going to start running the tool Seconds. Let me just um, time it as well. This is a very, very small, short design, so it's pretty quick. It'll probably still take three or four minutes, though. Um, and as that's running, I'll start a new terminal. Just using my submarine tool now. And we can uh, look at some basic stats as the design is working. So this is a, this is the list of the standard cells that Yotis has decided we need. So to, to build seven second seconds, we need 430 standard cells broken up uh, like this. So we've got uh, AND, OR gates, uh, AND gates, buffers, inverters, muxes, three cups of NANs, some NORs, ORs, uh, Plenty of different cells here. And there we go. This one is flip flops, so we needed 52 flip flops for that because we're going to need at least 24 for the uh, the seconds divider, and then another um, 12, 16 for the um, the digit counter. Let's just take a quick look also at um, in the PDK. We get all these standard cells that we can use, and uh, I just loaded them all up. So all these different cells that I just mentioned here, we have on the left-hand side, we've got about 140 of them. So if we take that uh, DX uh, flip-flop, uh, you can see this is the standard cell. These are the layers that are in use to make it work. There's about 24 different transistors here, all connected together. Um, and it builds up a flip-flop, and if we now take a look at um, a much simpler um, standard cell, this is just an inverter. If the input goes in high, the output comes in low, and this is built with complementary MOSFETs, CMOS, so we've got um, N-type MOSFETs at the bottom and P-type MOSFETs at the top, and they're joined together to push-pull arrangements. Uh, we've just finished this, so that whole flow took 1 minute and 44 seconds. Uh, let's, so let's continue with our, um, our route through. So we've just looked at synthesis. I'm going to go down now to floor planning. Um, so 
floor planning is looking at, okay, working out how much space we need, um, working out where the IOs are going to be, um, and giving us a kind of area. So let's see, let's measure the space. So this is 140 microns square. And then let's look at uh, the global routing. So now this is um, given us the power distribution network. So these uh, plus and minus lines run through the design. And then all these standard cells have now been placed roughly kind of close to where they need to be to fit the pins and also what functionality they're going to be uh, fulfilling. And then, but one thing is that they're not snapped to the grid um, or aligned very well to the PBM yet. So that gets done in detailed routing. And now everything is on the grid. Things should all be, see all these big cells, those are the, the flip-flops, they're all kind of grouped together because they're forming these uh, registers. Uh, we've got the IOs. And then the final stage is uh, generating the GDS. And now we have all the routing between all the cells, all the missing spaces being taken up by uh, filler, filler cells. And here we've got a list of all the different cells in use, and I can turn those on and off. So, for example, I can turn off all the decoupling capacitors that are used to fill up the space. Now we can see. What's this one? Down at the bottom, DCAP 12. It's funny, it's normally in alphabetical order, and I've already turned off the DCAP, so. Not sure where that one is, but you can see there's more space uh, now available. So the efficiency, the density of this design could be uh, even smaller. But we just wanted to get the tools done quickly. So this is now the full, the final design for that seven second seconds. We could now uh, integrate this into a design to EFL, send it off, and get our chips made. So. When you want to make a submission to eFabless, you do get this whole 10 square millimetres. This part here is always uh, present, which has a risk five core and some memory and some stuff to help you do the bring up, which can be uh, more complicated than you want sometimes. And then we can put our designs in here. Um, like I said, we had problems with this seven segment display countdown with all the, the, uh, the designs we put on MPW1 because we had hold problems. And those are caused uh, by not having enough time for the flip-flops to register data correctly. And unfortunately, you can't fix those problems by slowing down the clock. Um, but we were able to uh, get things working by very carefully undervolting the whole design and slowing things down. And that whole thing was caused by a misconfiguration in the tools so that the clock tree was synthesized in a not very balanced way. And that has been fixed for MPW2 and, and forward. So if you want to find out more about that, you can find out about that on this link. Uh, but uh, I was very happy that with a little bit of work on getting the voltage right, this tiny small design here, I did actually manage to get it working, although I had to kind of fake it because I could only get six out of the seven segments working at once. But that video was a, a demo of my design, of that design that you just saw being synthesized with those open source tools, being put onto the eFabless shuttle, being made by Skywater Foundry in the US, being packaged, being sent to me, mounted on a test board, and then running uh, that design and actually getting the output. So that was really, really fantastic step for me. My first uh, very simple designs working on an ASIC. But now is a good uh, moment just to. Um, am I still showing my screen? Yep. Um, now is a good moment just to mention that uh, one of the ways that I'm now involved in this space is I run a course called the Zero to Eight course. So 200 people have taken the course and we've submitted designs on all the shuttles. It assumes no prior knowledge, so this is a really good way of uh, getting involved 
if you want, if, you, if this does seem interesting to you and something that you want to find out more about, uh, check out the course. I've also been working with eFabless to help with the, um, the messaging and creating documentation. And I recently did a half an hour video that did a complete run through from downloading and setting up the tools, putting a simple design on, to running all the tests, to generating the GDS, to sending it out to eFabless and getting uh, the chip submitted to the shuttle. So that is about a half an hour watch on YouTube and you can check that out, you don't have to pay or anything. I just have a, a quick drink of water. So for MPW2 and onwards, um, I moved to a more automated design handling for putting people's designs together. So with the course, we typically take um, not always up to 16, but around 16 or so designs and we put them all together onto one submission so that we can uh, make the most of the pressure silicon. And each project has all the inputs always connected, but the outputs go through a tri-state buffer. So if they're not turned on, the outputs are floating and they don't affect the bus. But a bit of firmware can turn on the tri-state for a specific project. And you see that's what these highlighted lines are here. If I want to turn on this project, I turn on this line it activates the tri-state buffers and then the outputs of project zero control uh, the outputs of the actual chip um, and I've, I've successfully used that from mpw 2 3 4 5 and 6 although we're still waiting for silicon to come back it's now out of the factory mpw 2 is being tested right now so i should be able to validate that this all does work so fingers crossed for that uh, so now let's take a quick overview of uh, the tools in the space. That was something that Ruud Land said that he was especially interested in, so I wanted to include that in the presentation. Um, I built a list of a whole load of open source ASIC resources on a GitHub page, so you can click this link and get a big page of loads of resources. And these ones at the top are kind of the more digital focused uh, tools. So I have OpenLane, I demoed, Open Roads um, is less of a complete flow, but you can still use it. It takes a bit more work to get running. Silicon Compiler is another end-to-end -end ASIC flow, as is Coriolis 2. Um, OSS CAD Suite contains all the FPGA and synthesis tools that you would need for doing FPGA development. Um, and we also have um, OS FPGA and VHDL support, uh, to just mention a few there. On the analog side, um, we've got Magic in K-Layout. K-Layout was a tool that I was just using to show the GDS, but you can also use it to draw. Uh, x -Scan is a way of doing schematic capture um, and also builds into synthesis, um, simulation. Mosaic is a more modern schematic capture. NG Spice is a simulation tool for analog, and Zeiss is a, a, a kind of an upgraded NG Spice, more modern, uh, being funded fairly heavily can do parallel simulation which is important because the analog simulation is incre incredibly slow compared to the digital stuff and GDS factory lets you uh, draw GDS shapes very accurately and is in use for photonics so what's missing that's an important question we do have everything we need to do um, digital and analog designs all the way through and we're getting results back uh, but we do have tools that are missing for RF designs, uh, which is important. We want to be able to do things like radios. Uh, we're lacking full wave solders, solvers. Um, we've got only a few different types of analysis. We don't have harmonic balance, transient noise, etc. Um, we they do exist, but we haven't kind of checked them. We have we need to actually do, start doing verification. Uh, we could do with improvements to the physical verification. We need this to be scalable for new PDKs. It takes a lot of work at the moment to add a new PDK to be able to be uh, used in this process. Uh, better mixed signal simulation. So if you're doing an analog and a digital design together, you want to be able to check that everything works together as you expected. And that's actually a lot harder than it should be right now. Um, design for test, I said that was one of the things that was missing in um, the open lane uh, tool flow designed for test here you would want to 
insert a scan chain or a way of being able to easily access the interior parts of your uh, project. Um, there is work in progress there, but it's still uh, under test. Simulating power, simulating clock and clock distribution, and also a, a library of proven analog IP would be great, like a big block of uh, analog to digital converters, uh, clock drivers, SERDES, gigabit ethernet, all this kind of stuff. We're waiting for this library to get built out and be tested and be useful so we can uh, use different bits and pieces and know that it's going to work together. So having said that, let's take a look at some of the example projects that have been taped out over the last two years on the open source uh, flow on the Google free shuttle. So MPW1, uh, there was a very interesting um, processor taped out that aims to run uh, MicroPython and had a bunch of USB peripherals. And one of them, uh, especially the USB peripheral, uh, is microcoded, so it's a very nice bit of IP. So the idea is you could take this USB block, drop it in, and then with a bit of microcode, set it to be an audio interface or a keyboard interface or a mouse interface or whatever you want. Um, this little nice screenshot here is a PLL for a 3 gigahertz radio. Uh, Thomas Parry building amateur satellite radio transceiver, and that's a very interesting project. Fuse Risk is uh, two RISC V processes with some custom FPGA fabric in between them, and the FPGA fabric is supported by uh, Yosis and NextPNR. Subservient is a tape out of Surf, which is a very, very tiny RISC V processor, the smallest one. Uh, analog neural networks. MPW3 saw some testing of some other tools, so Coriolis 2. Um, and FlexCell, rather than using OpenLane and the standard PDK, um, an 8-bit A to D, and uh, RISC-V Arduino. MPW4 saw uh, some space-hardened stuff, a fun um, transistor in the shape of a skull and crossbones, radiation-hardened chip. Uh, MPW5 saw a Delta Sigma audio DAC, uh, Microwatt, which is a, a new type of processor coming out of um, from Anton Blanchard from IBM. OpenFA SOC is uh, analog generators, programmatic analog generators. Uh, MPW6 saw a 10 bit uh, SAR ATD, uh, some reram tests, and some chaos generators. But these are just very, very brief. Uh, sample projects. If you want to have a browse through, then you can use the eFabless website, and I've also just written a command line tool that lets you list all the tools and search them by their tape out status or uh, use grep or whatever you want to search for the, um, the descriptions of the projects. I just heard a ping on the uh, message, let me check what that was. A message from, from you? 20 minutes left, notification, thank you. So just a word on RISC-V. Um, I did a presentation for uh, RISC-V Japan recently, and one, I did a bit of data mining, and over the uh, six shuttles, there's been 270 RISC-V CPUs taken out. Um, I did a little bit of a breakdown here. We've got these other CPU types here, but RISC-V is the dominator, and then split up by type. Uh, these are all the different types. There's a lot of active development and testing going on with RISC-V in this space. And now I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the related uh, work in the field. So uh, SRAM characterization. Uh, we have an SRAM generator block that generates the IP that we use for the kilobyte SRAM if you need to use fast memory on your designs. But we didn't really know how well it worked, so Andrew Zinnenberg did some very interesting um, characterization with a test board and an FPGA. And as we get new versions, we can mount it on this test board, uh, plug it into the top of this board, and then run through this test again. If you want to find out more about that, you can check this. 
he really knows what he's doing in terms of high speed signal um, integrity and analysis. So it's a very interesting set of videos to check out. Uh, we had a, a fully open source ASIC focus conference last year that I organized with a lot of interesting talks uh, spread out over two days. Uh, there's the uh, there's WOSET workshop on open source EDA technology where people send us papers and uh, we review them and then there's a, a two-day schedule of presentations and you can check out the uh, papers and video presentations that were given in 2021 here and it's also being organized for 2022. Uh, there's been a lot of work now on putting the ASIC tools uh, running in the cloud, especially as either Jupyter Notebooks or GitHub Actions. So Proppy has been doing a lot of interesting work in enabling CMOS simulation and running the open lane tools and browsing the GDS files. And that is uh, really great for doing academic work and being able to share your results or educational work and avoiding big downloads. So if you imagine being able to um, let your students do simulation of these standard cells that I was talking about earlier, like ands and ors, but being able to do that all within the browser and without having to download uh, gigabytes of tools on your classroom computers, there's a huge amount of potential here for education, something that I'm especially excited in. And we've got uh, GitHub Actions. I've been working on a few GitHub Actions that can do things like installing the PDK, installing the tools, running the flow, running all the tests, and these are the kinds of things that I use um, for people on my course to make sure that the designs are all working. I recently had a very interesting interview with uh, a guy called Teo, who's been working on bringing up the open source uh, synthesis tools up to parity with the proprietary tools on matching the performance of their hardware adders. So previously, Yosis would always synthesize the same type of adder, which is kind of in the middle of this performance space. But if you wanted faster or smaller adders, for example, you couldn't choose those. So he did some very interesting work with allowing different types of structures of the, the carry chains of adders that allow you to uh, specify, I want an extremely fast adder because it's for the ALU of a RISC-V processor or I want a very slow but space efficient adder because I'm just doing like this seven segment seconds example that I showed you earlier and I just want my design to be really small. Uh, so more information on that here if you want to find out. And uh, we are testing his designs on MPW6. So now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about tiny tape out, which is something I've also been uh, discussing with Ruinland and uh, it seems like we're going through a bit of a Sputnik moment at the moment. Everyone wants to make sure that they uh, can have the skills uh, needed for uh, working in the semiconductor industry. We have these huge, very spread out, long supply chains. People are worried. We've got the EU and the US Chips Act, and more and more people are talking about education and getting more people into the pipeline to be able to be working on semiconductors in the future. Obviously not just a question of um, the material being available and the opportunities being available, but also that people think of it as a, as a valid career choice. And we see that uh, working in software is currently something that people are preferring due to better salaries. That's also something that needs to get fixed. Uh, but the educational side of things is important and Tiny Tape Out aims to uh, bring the barrier to entry lower for design and manufacture of ASICs uh, to high school students or makers or entry-level courses at university, open source silicon enthusiasts, uh, but ultimately creating the opportunity for all high st school tech students to design and receive their own chips. Uh, so it's a big goal, um, quite a difficult one to meet, but this is an idea of how what we could do to enable that. Uh, so I've already got a lot of experience with my own uh, course and something that's very important is that the course should be standalone. So you come into the course, you have an introduction on how the PDKs work, uh, you do simulation of standard cells in a web browser, there's no download of tools for this. Um, 
you do some problem solving uh, with digital logic, you build some combinational logic to start with, and then you move on to um, sequential logic and build these very small, simple circuits. And each segment of the course would be supported by templates and solutions, video introductions, and additional resources if you want to go further. Uh, you build your digital designs in the browser. So I've been working with Uri Shackard, who's um, built this uh, cool website called Wokwe, which is mainly for Arduino simulation, but he's uh, adapted it for us to use with digital logic. And we have this uh, very simple standard cell library here. And I can uh, give you an example of a, uh, a running simulation in the browser. I just press the play button here. I've got a 10 kilohertz clock signal coming in, and then these 12 clock dividers to get a slower flashing LED at the back. And we're running this simulation at 100% at uh, real time. And what we now has an API which allows me to take this number and use that to get a Verilog netlist, which will be uh, useful for the next um, section. So uh, let's move on. These are examples of the kinds of things that you can build in a very small area. So these are all for 70 by 70 microns. So these are some of the first kind of tutorial lessons, 8-bit counters, um, and uh, like this one is like the seven segment display. So you can see it easily fits in that 70 by 70. I tend to have missed a slide, here we go. So after we've got the uh, the uh, the URL, that number from Wokwe, we can use a GitHub action uh, which builds the GDS in the cloud. So I can come here, edit this make file, change the number here, and then when the GitHub action runs, it um, will automatically install, download the tools, um, and generate me the GDS. So again, I don't need to uh, install anything or download anything. And then I can see uh, the, the result of my design here. So this is the, the layout. And I've also got all the, uh, the information here on the reports, this, the final summary report, the synthesis report. So we're going to give everyone 100 by 100. Everyone's going to get eight ins and outs. Um, you can run through this whole process. And then at that point, um, you'll have experienced the process and you'll have learned something about digital design and ASICs and semiconductors. But now there's a pay wall. So now you can optionally pay for your design to be manufactured or your school can pay for you. Uh, we're aiming for $100 would get you your design on a chip, mounted on a PCB in your hand, and $25 would just get your design on a chip. So why would you bother with just getting a design on a chip? Well, that means it's, you can then, uh, as a school or a hackerspace, you can get an even cheaper price because you could get a workshop of 10 people, nine of them just put designs on, one of them gets the design and the, uh, the chip. Because all the designs are put on the chip, that means that the chip you get back can then be used to test all 10 designs. So that brings the cost of participation lower and you get your hands on the chip that has your design on it for very low price. So how do we put all these designs on? My current working demonstration, which I'll be taping out on MPW7, uh, features 500 designs at 100 by 100 and a little driver in the corner that can use the scan chain. So because it's a scan chain, things are uh, slower, but for beginner digital projects, that's no problem. We can still run them at 100 kilohertz. And we get 300 chips back, and those would then get mounted onto a PCB that we can then send out to people. Uh, so if you want to find out more information about how the scan chain works, you can uh, uh, check this. Uh, during this process while you're waiting, so that's one problem, six month wait is a long time for young people to wait. We're looking at ways of accelerating that. Um, but you would get emails about basics, ideas for designs, this week's coolest voted design, virtual factory tours, information when the wafers are out, information about when the PCBs are set up and sent. So that's, um, that's tiny tape out. And I've got another uh, few minutes, I hope. Yeah, 
uh, around 10 minutes. So 10 uh, minutes left, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I will ask around if there anyone here want to ask questions. Yeah, get, if you can get a list of any questions, and just in the last couple minutes, I'm going to do a quick, a very quick summary of what's happening next. Okay, so no one here, no, no one live here is going to ask questions. But, uh, but, but uh, Dr. Lee, could you, yeah, could you bring some comments or questions here, please? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. let, let me let me just let me just finish let me just oh, finish okay. this off. I just need uh, two more minutes. Okay, okay. Um, so we've got multiple educational projects happening. Uh, we've got the IEEE Chipper Farm. We've got lots of funding happening in the space. We've seen the EU and the uh, US Chips Act. The EU Chips Act specifically mentions open source multiple times in their investment plan. Uh, we have a huge amount of community growth. Um, we've got the 90 nanometer uh, PDK <laughs> that's just been announced last week from Skywater, and we're expecting another, 100, another 130 and 180 coming soon. And uh, now's the time to get involved. So uh, get download the tools, follow my video, take my course. Uh, next uh, tape out is MPW7 on uh, the 12th. As a thank you uh, to being invited for this presentation, I've made uh, five $200 discount codes for my course. You just need to use COSTCUP22 as the, um, the promotional code. Uh, lots of resources here, and feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter, sign up to my newsletter, and if you want to check out in detail any more of what I've been talking about, then the slides are all on this link here. So that's it, that's my presentation. Thanks very much Thank uh, you. for your interest and uh, your time. And yeah, if there's any questions, then I believe we've got uh, five minutes left. Yeah, uh, Dr. Leeps, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mary Sue. You you, uh, your slide provide a very interesting and a very promising process of open source EDA tools. And uh, since the, the, the time is limited, so I would like to ask you, can you share with us your experience to avoid uh, the, uh, the failure you, you encountered in MPW1 so that we might be able to bypass this this is a fault process, so we can learn how to create a right, right way to create an a, 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 a ethic from ourselves. Thank you. Yes, uh, good question. So the open lane tool is meant to be uh, an end-to-end -end flow that you put your design in and you just get the design out. That's like the aim, but things don't always work like that, as we saw for MPW1. But uh, Really, the best way that you can um, help with that is just to get involved and start making designs because the more designs we have, the more tests we can do. And when the problems with MPW1 were found, they were fixed in the tool chain. So um, you can use the latest tools that don't have those bugs. Uh, that's the easiest fix. But you can also uh, read the source of the tools and you can make your own fixes and make your own pull requests uh, to the open source tools. And that's one of the great things about the open source tools is that there's a very uh, quick iteration time in getting uh, these bugs fixed quickly. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, so we're having actually around three minutes left. So may, may, uh, I, will, I, will, I would like to ask something that uh, Matthew, uh, how is the tiny table adopted? Uh, how is the adoption rate? Uh, how many, you know, you must be lobbying around the high schools. How many high schools have been already adopted the tiny table program? Uh, well, Tiny Tape Belt is still in a very, um, in the idea phase, so at the moment I'm explaining the idea to people and presenting it and uh, finding, trying to find collaborators. So I want to work less with schools and more with uh, people above the schools who can say these 10 schools would all be interested. Um, so I'm also working with um, academics in university bodies um, and there's there does seem to be a lot of interest, um, but I'm still kind of waiting for the person that can say, um, 
I am working with making sure that, uh, that schools are teaching uh, relevant technology. Uh, this looks like a great thing and we want to run it across these uh, 30 schools as a trial. And then that will be the, the moment that I will um, kick the design off. Um, either that or for MPW7 for the test, I'll just make it free to participate and we'll see how many people we can get involved just to test it out. Okay, thank you a lot. So I will, uh, because we are having another speaker already here, so I will be mm -hmm. ending this part. But uh, uh, Dr. Lee, I know you must have a lot of questions we'd like to ask with the Matthew. So I will hand up from my side. Hand up from my side, but uh, you can continue to discuss with Matt if you want, if you like to. So here we go. Uh, uh, okay, I will go go to another session. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Danish, Danish, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, just give me one second to adjust my. Uh. Oops. It's kind of messy here because I just switched from <laughs> one side to another. Okay, here we go. Uh, you are you are up and online, and uh, let me. Uh, uh, without further ado, let's in, uh, introduce uh, Dinesh from in, uh, India, who is uh, working on the pin-to-pin -pin convertible RISC-V SLC, which is very, very interesting. And please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks, Rana. Let me share my... You are able to see my desktop? Yeah, yes, it's very clearly. Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. First of all, thanks for, uh, for the invitation. Share my experience on the open source shuttle and one of the projects what I am sharing. So, about myself, uh, I have around 20 plus year experience on the VLS design. I have worked a lot on the most of the aspect of RTL to GDS flow from uh, architecture to uh, depot and also I have a lot of experience on the post silicon debug and system framework. In my career I worked for more, most of the more, more most of the commercial depots around 180 nanometer to all the way down to 10 nanometer. So I worked in a company uh, like uh, Cypress Semiconductor, Centilium and currently I am working in Intel as a design manager at Intel India. So this let me start my presentation. I thought just thought I'll just give a brief background on what is this open MPW shuttle project what we are discussing. So this is the sponsored by a shuttle which is sponsored by Google and it is managed by an EFWS team and the tapers are done in the Skywater uh, foundry which is a 130 nanometer. And if you see the main uh, points are, there are 40 free shuttles are given per shuttles, free slots are available. And currently the way it is running, I see there are 4 shuttles are there per year. This is an approximation I am just saying. The main requirement is to keep the design complete in the open source. Uh, your design you need to keep it in the open source. And uh, the cost of the fabrication, packaging and the file evaluation board and shipping it to everything is covered by Google. And in this, uh, when you are, who are for the chance, they are going to get a 50 parts, packaged parts, and five development board, they get it. So if you see the, how the actual uh, design is uh, going to sit within the open shuttle, the Caravan, the EFWS team has created uh, one harness where they created their own small PCV uh, core here. If the projects are without any risk core, you need an external way to configure it. You can use their risk key, small risk is there, which we can use to configure it. And for a user angle, they given a 10 mm square free space. So whatever design you, you we, we develop, it's going to fit within that and the, your final integrated chip will be looking uh, like this. So it is a 38 pin package and uh, the pins are already frozen, but uh, you have a control that they given a subway, you can manage this IOS. 
and you can control it. So this is how what the, the MPW shuttle project. So about the, my experience wise, actually I started on open source shuttle around December 2020 times. Uh, I think that time exactly the MPW1 which was also already announced on the 2020 December which I was not uh, attempted in any, any of the project on that one. So, but I started for the MPW2 which was uh, around the June 2021 timeline the paper was planned. So, since they, they could, because of my sort of experience I don't want to do a small project, I thought of taking a basically SWE based SOC design. So, I thought maybe that's what I should do as I must, my first trial. So, but when I started, it was like, a, it was a tough ride for me, which I thought it will be a smooth ride with my experience, I thought. But uh, when I started uh, running, using the tools, I see a lot of issues. In the most, mostly in this, most of the issues, you can see the system were like, limited system were like support was there in the simulator and I were like, and synthesis. So, whatever SOC design I picked, Nearly, I need to modify nearly 20 to 30 percent of the design to match, uh, compile the simulation design in say, able to simulate within the same simulator and synthesis. So that was it took my lot of my effort, and I done a two and pro to find out is it my design correctly working and simulator working. And some of the places tool was compiling, but uh, synthesizing, but it is uh, totally optimizing the design because of some specific system where lost in syntaxes. So I can say it, so it was a tough way I to simulate it, cross check the simulator is not uh, totally optimizing the design. And also uh, since only there were limited complex SOC was there, only MPW1 was taped out, I had very limited references to cross check to flow, flow wise. And also in the flow wise I found it, uh, it was like a totally a lot of, uh, a lot of instability was there in MPW2 time. I see each macro to synthesize it, I was, uh, it was, uh, two was breaking in one or the other place, you know, it may be synthesis or clock tree and power routing, global routing, one or the other places, uh, two were breaking. I need to place a bug report on the corresponding tools and uh, those are iterations. So, so it, it was, I can say it's a, it's a lot of effort uh, gone in my first, first step in uh, experience way. And also one of the things what I saw was the, how the tool, the porting map, the mechanism they managed. Uh, so the, the concept what they done is, first the, there is an independent, uh, the um, open source community tools are managing independently, the YSCs, Iverla, uh, Magic tools are independently managed by the independent open source community. Those are picked by open web team and they were merging it and creating a open lane tools. So one of the main issue was there was open link team, open road team was picking a version which is somewhat older, like a three to four months, six months older than the main branch. And they are collecting it and creating an open lane. And that open lane once again, if it is taking it and creating their own additional patch and releasing it to the open source, our open source shuttle project teams. So whenever there was a bug and when I report into the main source uh, common, uh, so tools, when they fix it, taking that to throw the flow itself was becoming a big problem because of the additional patches what uh, eFibless team used to add. So it was like, because of that, I was faced multiple issues to find out how the tools work, uh, mechanism is there to break it so that I am able to complete my taping activity. So overall, so it, these all things took me more than six months to understand how the flows are implemented. But finally, after uh, around six to eight months, I got to clear the, my tape out uh, checklist. And one of the things I observed is during MPW is there was no clear timing closure mechanism. So they were more on the GDS clean database than the timing closure. That's what the stress was there. And even though I raised multiple times, the interest was, there was no less follow-up was happened around the timing closure. So this is what was my first experience in uh, the MPW2. Next MPW3 was around 15th uh, November 2021 time. That time I, since I had some experience from the previous one, I tried a two tape ports that time. And this time what I see it is uh, somewhat better managed in the sense uh, the open road team himself was managing the 
total to uh, directly giving. So the additional patch is what ETH address used to do that got uh, removed. So effectively, whatever uh, the open community tools were directly can be easily ported. So that reduced a lot of efforts uh, on my side. So whenever I see a new bugs are fixed in the main tool, porting became somewhat easy. So, so with that and also because of the, my previous shut, uh, whatever the effort, it helped me to uh, clean up the tape out activities well within the timeline. And I can say it's a bit uh, smooth ride for me at least compared to MPW2. And uh, and MPW4 to MPW6, uh, I done around 8 a -ports. So, and I can, I can say it's, it's, it's a bit smooth trade because of the total under starting what I built up on the previous uh, tape ports helped me. So, around next uh, 3 MPW, I nearly taped out around 8 shutters. We will go through brief on some of these uh, tape ports, what I have done. This is just to flash what are the tape ports I done in the MPW shutters. So around uh, 8 na S recipe based tape ports are done and around 3 non recipe based tape ports are done. And if you see in MPW 2 time I try attempted only one. In MPW 2 3 times I attempted 2 uh, MPW shutters. In MPW 4 I tried 2. And in MPW 3 5 I attempted 3 tape ports. And MPW 6 I attempted uh, 3 tape ports. We will go a little bit on each and main project to what is there and what is what I was driving there. So this this is the first project what, what I uh, draw in the MPW shuttle MPW 2 time. And uh, here we basically uh, what I took is uh, I took in uh, Santa Co uh, Risvi 32 bit core and uh, I tried to uh, I build an uh, H4 interconnect and I added a uh, uh, you call the SPI master to talk to the external flash because there was no in, inbuilt flash was there, uh, flash memories are not there in the uh, Skywater Foundry or Foundry, whatever libraries they share, we don't have any flash memories. And also I integrated an SDRAM controller for, for our data random, the data memory purpose, for the risk to have a data purpose. And also I added some peripherals like a UART, I2C master and USB 1.1 host and this is, was my first MPW 2 tape ports and uh, in this so that's what, in the design wise I made lot of changes in the uh, system verlock logics around this to match to simulator to work within the open open shuttle tools and one of the things I can highlight is that with this whole thing I am the tool set was I am able to only meet the timing with uh, 50 megahertz only. So I made a, each blocks, these main blocks, these whole blocks runs in a different block domain against uh, this week core. This week core had its own block domain, but till uh, finally the uh, current the tool, MPW tool set was able to only meet the design only within 50 megahertz only. This was my first attempt uh, what I tried in the MPW two time. So this is one of the non risk based tape out what I tried in the open shuttle which is like a, which I tried for MBS controller where in MPW 2 times there were some SRAMs are uh, developed by the other teams and I took those SRAMs and I built an MBS controller where it is going to test how, how reliably these memories are coming and I wanted to validate my MBS also which is required for my future development so I added the uh, MPS controllers so here basically I put uh, 4 uh, uh, 8 uh, uh, memories I think some are 2 KBs some are 1 KBs I think some type is here so, so basically I tried an uh, MPS controller with 8 MPS controller and 8 memories and this aim is to just to see my MPS controller and also how this SRAMs works and here I one more interesting important things I taken care is I given a four location memory memory repair options I given in this MBS control. So that is a feature I wanted to validate in this MBS control. So next one is uh, just a upgrade version of the previous MBS controller where I tried a logic beast. 
So the current uh, open shuttle doesn't currently support the scan method. There, be, there is no way you can implement a scan and validate your design uh, implemented correctly. So I done some hacking in the flow and uh, I built an 8 channel scan in scanouts. I took the previous MB test uh, project and added a serial scan in and created on my own LBS controller where it created the uh, peer based pattern and uh, transfer a duration and checks that the final signature matches with the golden. This is just to check how the scan is going to run in that uh, system. Uh, so this is the project uh, which is one, one of the non risky projects which I turned in the open sheet. So now let's come back to the RISD now which is the one which I am nearly driving at least I tried nearly I am trying the 8 tapers around this architecture. So this is this is an 32 bit RISD based SOC design where I am trying to target the pin its, its pins are matching with the Arduino platforms. So, so if you see it this was a somewhat upgraded version of my first RISD core. And I made some little bit changes in design. I added a cache, like instruction cache and data cache, and, uh, and uh, a tight memory added. And I split the core into uh, three, sp three splits. The main control of the risk core I separated out and uh, I built an interconnect so that if I want to add a multiple cores, I can connect it. And uh, so, so they kind of they connected the directly through them. Uh, they commonly supported an I cache and B cache for them. And, they, and there is a common architecture created for the wishbone interconnect where individual peripherals can be connected. So I connected uh, the quad SPA master and two UARTs, uh, I2C master and uh, USB 1.1 host and SSPA. And uh, the ADC actually I am not yet integrated, I am looking for some community help to integrate this. Um, I am more expo expert in the digital side, unlike I need some help. So I am continuously monitoring with something in the open source set things I can fill, pull and add it here. So currently ADC is the one which is uh, missing in this design. And apart from that I added a pin max. The aim of the pin max is to match the pins uh, as it in, uh, in the audio. So, so some of the things wise. So one more, one more thing I added is I given a uh, booting options. So there are three ways you can boot the whole chip. You can boot through the Caravel has its own uh, wishbone interface. You can go through that. You can boot the whole chip. You can configure it and wake up the risk core. So that uh, uh, you can even through this you can configure the external flash. And uh, once you uh, program the program it, then you can wake up the risk core. So the system brings up that things. So there is one more mode I given is a UART. So UART wise also there is a message handler I built it here. The external if you are connecting through the uh, UART, you can go and configure as it comes as a master, you can go and even configure the flash. I given a standard uh, write uh, and read commands through the serial uh, port. You can go and configure it. Even though Caravel uh, interface was not working, I can go through this and then I can boot the whole system. That was the uh, given a backup options here. And third option I given is the SPA slave. So this is uh, something similar to what you see in ISP in Arduino. I made a sim same pin compatible to ISP where, where you can uh, through the SPA of the ISP you can go and configure uh, all the flashes and you can bring up the chip. So there are three booting options what I implemented in the uh, as it is not like in the first version I supported in MPW so I, I can say it's over individual MPW, I done some improvement. Like these are the final design what can publish here. And one more thing is, uh, one more thing is from MPW six onward, uh, I am able to meet a timing um, at, at at least at 100 megahertz. So previously, as I told in the first one, the maximum time I am able to close is only 50 megahertz. But with the tool improvements and some design changes in the pipeline, now currently the design is able to meet at 100 megahertz, which is I can say is, is a good improvement from the, the over the shutter. And uh, one more thing I can 
series. Actually, the design wise, it is not like a one single clock domain design. So, I implemented uh, a multi clock domain domain the designs where the risk score has its own clock. It has a core so that a timing of risk score is not deciding the rest of the clock domains. So, system clock has separate clock and this is built with separate clock. So, so, uh, so increment on the risk score can not, uh, uh, timing of the risk score is not um, influencing the system core uh, timings. So, so basically created an hierarchical, hierarchical based design so that it is simplifies in backend things. Nearly most of these blocks are independent hard macro inside the design. These are the main highlights of the project and here just to show it how I am trying to map the uh, RISDINO with the Art, Art Mega and Arduino pins and uh, here the pins uh, which are listed in this uh, white color are, are the RISDINO pins what I am trying to match with the uh, Art Mega pins. These the rest of the pins are what Art Mega and uh, uh, Arduino is having it and I am trying to match these pins and uh, wherever the D's are there they are digital pins and unlock A for unlocks and uh, apart from this actually uh, the, the whatever the uh, terrible projects given 38 pins and what I needed was so only 24 bits 24 bits rest of the things uh, since there is no internal uh, flash and uh, SRAMs I use them for their external uh, SRAM and flash purpose until we have an internal flash option currently I am totally dependent on the external flash to boot the design but rest of the 24 pins I try to match with the Arduino Arduino flag so overall if you see currently I am driving 3 uh, projects in on uh, the Arduino and uh, so I try to create a more, uh, some generic concept so that even you have, when you add more cores it will work uh, transparently. You see currently the first one, this Dino X core is a single core uh, uh, Arduino where I connected only one RISC-V core and uh, really the rest of the cores are name functions are same. And the second one which I am trying is multi-core type wise is a second RISC-V core I brought in here where uh, rest of the interfaces other things are matched. Uh, but uh, the interconnects uh, has some changes to support the second core here and one more I am supporting is the quad core so uh, currently I am supporting the max up to 4 core so that is based basically because of the whatever the space free space I have in the uh, open lane shuttle uh, which is uh, 10 mm square currently I am maximum able to fit the 4 cores that's what these are the 3 currently I am driving and most of the time I am attempting 3 tapers one with S cores, a D core and a quad core just to set uh, the, how the physical view is uh, going to look because uh, normally we will have a doubt uh, when you do an SOC with the 10 mm square how much space uh, you would have squeezed whether if there is any empty space to add new function and those questions comes up so that is the reason I added this uh, my placement view of the each core just to have a idea how this uh, design, how much uh, design is congested or uh, how much free space is there and if you want to add an additional IPs uh, so it can is it uh, there is a space is there or not just to highlight it I given this view if you see the S code around 30 percent of the design is free so it is around uh, the total instances 94k instances are there and 85, in that 81k is the combo logics and 13k is the sequential flop server so it is around 100k instance uh, design I can say. and in that I can see I see around 30% design is free that means if, if I have some additional IPs uh, where I can go and add it so it is not so congested and I am, I am looking as the uh, tools are getting improved so the utilization of the uh, info it should have it and you should get a more a smaller area it will take for the each IP so you will get some more IPs you can plug it so I can see the 10 mm square is a good space to play around to create any good and IoT chip and uh, just to just to see the little bit dense again uh, deep core with still the 15 to 20 percent free space is there <coughs> this is around 120k instance uh, design 
the core core is somewhat congested i can say it is only less than 5000 free space is there which i i will reserve kept for an adc here otherwise uh, it's nearly filled space and that is the reason i stopped at a core code because there was no much space left for me to add additional cores this is i see around 160k instance uh, design this is just to give a brief how this resdino over the period can help uh, over the arduino just i try to put my way see currently if you see the arduino there are uh, uh, fixed memories are there flash memories if you want to take any things you have to bring one more different uh, configurations of the arduino to build it since currently it is an external flash you can go and uh, add uh, additional flash and it's up to 64 mb there is no limit on uh, whatever flash you want to add there and uh, so if you want to do an add on add on so you need typically in arduino cases you need to bring the new new boards uh, new new ch uh, chip configuration you need to bring but here you can design you can add those configurations into the uh, your resdino project itself so that you can create uh, your customized uh, chip which uh, nearly matches like an arduino means you can even compare in arduino environment itself one one thing i missed in my discussion time was uh, it is not only pin compatible it is going to run in the arduino ide itself so you can even run the your uh, c code in the arduino for platform with the package of the arduino you can compile it and you can use that in my uh, our arduino project so currently at least six to eight c code of the arduino arduino software i ported already i am cleaning up one by one the firmware hopefully within some time i will have a very clean arduino platform there and uh, you see and some of the arduino features missing i can see is uh, the keyboard some of those features are missing you can go and add those into this soc and also if you want to reduce the design so arduino is like it's already hard and correct but since this is a soft ip for you these people can use that to reduce some of the ips which you feel not required and you can decide what ip is required and you can go and optimize it and this is still valid for your power and performance also you can go and squeeze the design so that you can get a much better uh, controlled design this is just just my first thought on the resdino project when i started this is just to show what is the open source shuttle wise what are my just going back and uh, just going back and open source shuttle just to say what are my pin points and what are the issues currently i see in the open source shuttle see one of the main issue i can see is even though tape outs are happening as per the dates chip delivery is not happening so even though i done my first tape out in june to 2021 still i have not received my first tape chip so it is already running one year back now. Hopefully, EWS team take it uh, seriously and uh, try to get some chips as early as possible so that our silicon iteration will complete. So that uh, the next chip will be comes out in a better, better, so better shape. Otherwise, we are just whatever the uh, issues we are thinking from a verification angle only we are modifying. We are not getting a silicon data, which is uh, I think is the one of the critical thing uh, is missing. One more thing I can say is. the mpw shuttles are continuously that the tool flows are continuously getting changed the projects like us me mine which is uh, uses the previous shuttle to continue so once again i need to readjust this flow so from my angle if you see i am looking more from the tool improvement than the flow i feel flows are somewhat okay i don't see much changes are required i am looking for a more in the tool improvement um, but currently i see both are getting improved changed But readjusting them it's also is a becoming one type of pain I can see. Third important thing I can see is still some critical functions are missing in the open source shuttle program. Like even the SRAM is there only only one KB and two KB only two type of SRAMs are released for the people to use it. That also not fully qualified so that is a risk we are carrying. And I don't see any flash or EEPROM currently available for user to use it. Another thing I can see is that. Uh, LEC and the scan uh, is still not those functionals are not integrated, so we have a 
big risk if you want to be thinking for a commercializing tapeouts this tapeout can be used for commercial purpose still i think this critical function mixing i see it's still we need to close this to say we can use these tapeouts for commercial and also low power methodology i don't see any uh, direction how we can going to even low power methodology to reduce the power clock gating those things i, I don't see a clear methodology yet. and one more thing which i see is need to directly use my chip into actual any commercial or after any ports issue i see the caravel the default harness setup because if you see currently i already caravel team have their own recipe for and i also have one more recipe for it is like a duplicate recipe for so that to handers to just to create a proof of concept what you want to create then i need to keep keep two flash which is uh, Which which is somewhat uh, is deviating from a standard uh, board configurations. I think that's one thing I can say is a critical issue what we see from this chart. As a summary, guys, what I can say is it's is a great opportunity for the university and researchers uh, from the for the software people since since all the tools are open, there are plenty of opportunity into it. So so all the source codes are available in the GitHub's. people who are having a good idea they can go and use it improvise it so it's a good opportunity for the, all the idiot uh, software people who want to contribute to the open source and also for the research community in the wireless domain also they can plan their new chips around the new new ics around the iot healthcare and automation mm, these are the things so what i i had it for this today presentation that's all Thanks a lot for your wonderful experience on sharing this, and I'm very, very surprised that you haven't received the MPW2 chips because, from my understanding, that they should be already sent to their participants. So <laughs> this is kind no, of MPW1 only they are given. MPW2 they are saying uh, August end there. I see. I see. Yeah, I can completely understand. Uh, completely ag agree with you that the users needs to needs to improve improvements instead of their fancy flow <laughs> improvements because we are the users of the the the, the open land and we want you to use it to do our projects just like yours, your risk domain, you know, which is very inspiring, and we want it to work. And also the harness SOC from Efablus is kind of restrictive to users. I can agree with you that uh, because many people here in Taiwan are actually thinking that maybe we can use the harness, uh, use the MPW. Uh, sponsored mpw shadow to do their test trips and for tiny or you know the soho this oh sorry <laughs> the, 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 the screen flickers so i i was thinking that i was disconnected anyway uh, so many soho's and many makers are thinking that they will once think that they can use the a uh, free shadow to do their products but this is not the case just as you, just as you say because the harness chip is there and the uh, io control is very you know not very working <laughs> because uh, from my understanding yeah. yeah yeah the 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 people from and uh, if i remember correctly that some people are complaining that the uh, gpio control from the harness chip is actually broken Yeah, so <laughs> that is very sad. Uh, but one, uh, so regarding your slides, I have one thing one, one we wish to ask. That is, uh, uh, you 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 have mentioned that you have many uh, risk five cores. You know, you have the D risk uh, double core risk dunial and the uh, three cores unit uh, risk 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 dunial and the four cores unit risk dunial. So how the The cores interact with with each other. Do you have any kind of uh, mailbox that uh, one core could notify another core that what it what it is doing, or is it just planning uh, use some kind of a uh, polling mechanism to con communicate with with each other? Currently, that's what hardware hardware same for way that thing. And I because see. each one is and I just echo him. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You can't hear me. Huh? Sorry. Uh, I can. Can you hear me? 
I, I can hear you. Uh, s sorry, did I say something wrong or? No, no, I'm not able to hear you. I'm able to hear you, but you're not able. Uh, we're having some kind of connection error, so. Uh, can I log in? Again? Okay, so hi, hi, hi. I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so actually, there's, there's. I just want to ask that you do you have kind of a mailbox to for your risk five course to connect with with each other on your risk two nil, uh, or it's just plainly uh, via the you know memory swapping kind of stuffs. Okay, I see. Thanks a lot for your wonderful project. And do we have any questions on the on the field? No. Okay. So thank you very much, and we wish you a great success in the following MPW shadows. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks. Huh?我们下一场会有一段时间之后就是各位如果想要先离席对所以有兴趣的话可以可能等一下这场会是日本人啊所以也是口音也是比较重一点的如果各位是比较想要跟<笑> 呃，我觉得也跟因为他的ISA是pattern free 有关啦，就是当然你可以说MIPS也是现在就反而也很便宜，可是就以学术界来讲，当然一定是喜欢这种open pattern 的，那对，所以，嗯哼，呃，我们公司有赞助这场研讨会，对，就是我们是 Golden Sponsor，那我们的确也是像像接下来这个讲者，他抱歉，我我快速稍微 take up 一下。就是我们的确也是有像有一些open source的code，那就会希望说可以让就是讲者可以做，不讲者，让让我们的partner可以可能maybe先做前前期的测试啦，跟这包对，像我们这场就是他拿我们的open uh,不就不就不就,因为那边我买我就不讲钱公司是什么,然后现在在sci-fi,对,那他们,那,这个讲法,念法的sci-fi,对,我们,呃,像,我们CTO是那个Young Policy是尽量希望可以enable一些客户 对，那这边就是，真的当然也，如果你要比较好的，那当然要签 NDA。可是就如果你只是，只是 want to want a taste of the respite，然后some basics of 
per peripherals such as the interrupt controllers or stuff like that is free and open source. You can just take it on from a GitHub. Yep. Okay,我們這一場其實很擔心會不會黃掉,因為其實他很最後才敲定,然後他當時又有,因為他其實有些slice是他的partner的property,然後他就來回check很久才說他可以講,可是後來他email response又不是非常的responsive,可是我就已經
反正我我最后一场那个时间非常非常的 free， 我跟我跟最后就我这我这一轨最后一场，我跟他讲说我我会需要非常 flexible 的搬动他的 session，、okay. 然后他如果如果这个日本有问题，我再跟他解释。没有没有，他他他只能延后了，还不能提前。对对对对对。那我他是哪里啦？这样恐怖哦、喔！一直听到 notification， 那东西不知道是哪里，靠呀！我到底，到底哪里在喷那个 notification？ 他什么？三十五分，这样这场就是。今日本还没出现，对。嗯、哇塞，真真的没有啊！我觉得，啊，真真的没出现，不知道什么状况。他，我我我是跟，因为当初其实谈的很临时，所以我连他的 connect， 就是我甚至连他的，就我只有他 email， 对我没有他的任何其他的联系手段。然后我现在非常的囧，哎，啊天啊！因为跟他是有改过一次时间啦，所以他如果真的，如果他完全是，我我先，对我。对，就就就我就我刚刚有跟在场有些人讲，如果比较想听，就是比较就是比较比较口音比较没什么问题的，何必有一场那个三三点钟开始？我要打岳阳电话，好像有他的代表号。
就联络到他了，可是他说他为了三印，可是我现在呃看看三印什么状况。Hey, Kawasaki. So, so sorry, so sorry, so sorry for the the <laughs> the, the. I know the 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 arrangement has been kept ch changing, and I'm very very sorry. My sincere apology to all the inconvenience. Oh, that's no problem. So, um, are you guys ready? For this? Yeah, yeah, we have plenty of. Uh, let me show you around. <laughs> Here are okay. our audiences, and they are very eager to know from your your experience and also the RISFI Tokyo days. They are very excited to know things about it. Okay, thanks. So let's see how that goes. How that goes. Let's see. All right. Um, Mm, yeah, this is it. So, do I uh, have I share the sc screen? Yeah, it's up and running, very clear. And okay, open. great. Okay, you you can okay you, you can just uh, start your session, and uh, without further ado, let's uh, give a big hands to the speaker. Okay, thanks. Um, my name is uh, Shunpei Kawasaki. I, sh I show up on, as a, the second author because this is about the, the chip de development. And um, I'm titling this uh, presentation Marmot RISC V SOC Leveraging Open Source ISA IP Process Development Kit and the Media Tools. And then I collaborated on this uh, like effort with at the University of Electro Electrocommunications. So um, today's agenda is like I'll have a short introduction about lightweight IoT to, that we did in 2016. And then now we are working on the bridge structural health monitoring IoT. And then we talk about some, some little things about the how hardware security and like remote IoT authenticity proof and uh, open source software security such as root of trust chip integration over the S of the update and uh, open source Marmot risk file SOC finally and then future directions and summary. So um, SH Consulting has been around since 2013 and then uh, we also have this subsidiary in, t in Vietnam that's 2014 and we have been um, in our prior life we did that this SH flash MCU chips, embedded software and hardware, and development tools, video games, Java card, secure MCU firmware, and FIPS 140 certification. So we did, since like 2013, we started out a ultra lightweight IoT, and which actually only weighed at 180 grams. And then no one else actually pursued this like lightweight IoT side. So when the volcano activity started in um, Kyushu Island, uh, we had um, top share for a very short period of time for drone, drone transport, transported I, IoT. And in 2008, 19, we decided to just actually increase further that application market size to capture this infrastructure IoT for structure health monitoring to be applied to bridge. And in the meanwhile, we did all sorts of things like designing consumer equipment, motor control, and an automotive ECU. But I think what happened was that the IoT survived. So 
that in 2018, suddenly, like, that the Sakurajima just erupted. And uh, suddenly, like, that the, they needed the drone to just actually host that uh, host uh, IoT to a very dangerous area where sulfuric acid gases around. And then in it, like, that we use that uh, wireless IoT. And in the 2013, we have been always trying to just actually do that, like implement um, risk five. And uh, we finally were able to do it by um, having one of our guys just actually started as a PhD student and then use that academic um, fan. And then this is um, based upon Rome. 0.18 micron meter. And then we use that the same exact uh, rocket um, SOC generator to generate this chip. And it is like that uh, five meter by five meter, 180 nanometer Rome shuttle with a fairly reasonable amount of 64 bit architecture, R R the 64 um, GC. And <clears throat> in the meanwhile, that uh, this whole Mammoth IoT system has been uh, developed. Oh, and uh, this figure shows an example. And essentially what it, this does is like, it doesn't have any cable connection. Uh, Everything is done by the, the wireless. And, and, uh, Mr. Essentially Cohen. that's, Hi, yes. Mrs. Wong, I'm so sorry to interrupt, uh, but uh, I'm not sure if you're uh, showing your slides or because your slides freeze at the very first page. Oh. So I'm wondering, so I was, I was thinking that, oh, it's a very long intro, but I was, I was thinking, no, you're referring to some pictures. So I'm thinking Why? that <laughs> that's that's not, that, that shouldn't be the case. Yeah, sorry for interrupt. And I, 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 the new slide now? Yeah, I can, I can see the, the, sc the scroll into your slide. Uh, we are now on uh, slide s seven. Uh, now it's eight. Okay, that's good. So ju I'll just actually use use the, the slide like this um, rather than using that. Uh, the presentation. I see. I see. So yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I will. I will share around your slides after the talk, and we are keep going here okay. from here. It's okay. Okay. Thank you. So like back, back to the, the chip topic. This is the uh, chip that we did in 2019 using academic shuttle. But the only problem with that academic shuttle is we can't carry this chip outside of that uh, campus. Because of course, you know, like once you build a chip, you have to just integrate it in, into the board and then just actually see, and then the software integrations and so forth. But um, so a rest restriction by that the two companies didn't allow that to happen. So what happened was essentially um, we um, had a very good experience, but then we just actually um, started back to this board system, I mean, system development, which is which we call Mammoth system. And um, so the way that it works is like that you just put on a different part of that the bridge um, things like gateway and an endpoint. And then typically like that you use like multiple endpoints for like that the gateway. And then every sensor that, um, and then actuator that shows up in the, um, this type of setting is all connected to um, by wireless. And what it does is essentially, you know, there's a dis displacement that the bridge causes. And then over the season, you know, like it displaces and every day because of the temperature dis displacement changes. And then you capture and then monitor and then somehow you are able to figure out what kind of a structural health that the bridge span has. Actually, this is like more like the know-how of that, uh, the companies that are using those type of IOTs. So the type of um, application 
knees is like long term no maintenance, like five years of like usage, left as is. And of course, it has to be harvest its own energy, um, solar energy and uh, lithium batteries. But, you know, like since it doesn't have any kind of cable whatsoever, the installation, installation is very cheap because you only have to just nail down those devices and then program. And uh, also, obviously, like that, uh, you would like to have that over the air software upgrade from the remote location. And also, um, obviously, uh, because this is like regional government and then they don't have a whole lot of money. Um, but first of all, like, like, there are like 700,000 bridges in Japan and then about 90% of them are just owned by municipalities rather than the central government. And they don't have a whole lot of budget to just actually burn on that uh, monitoring bridges and then decaying infrastructure. So this is more like very unattractive um, marketing. But yet, um, you know, like it moves, moves slow enough that uh, we can catch up as a small company. But anyway, so using the consumer grade components for low cost is like one of the uh, requirements. And then uh, also, system security against hacking. If um, all those like a, like a, like a boxes are just hacked by someone else, it's going to be all sorts of sad, um, you know, like incident. So therefore, that we didn't um, really <coughs> want to have that happen. And uh, um, another thing is, so this is like the set very like looking very cheap using that uh, off the shelf boxes but it has got the gateway master slave endpoint and sensor and actuary and then suddenly we we move into this uh, like risk 5 thing so as as we are using like risk 5 ip as as a chip for this uh, system and then um, the, the, the type of like risk five that we're going to be using is at the bottom here, like 32-bit chip that has got Arthos on it. Over the years that we have uh, developed both like Linux IoT and then Arthos IoT, and then it, we found out that Linux IoT, in the end of the day, it you know, consumes like five, minimum five, of, <clears throat> and in some cases, 50 watts of power. In com compared to that, uh, like Altos IoT can actually run some tasks on 50 milliwatt to 180 milliwatt. Because like that, uh, the memory is a thousand times bigger in the Linux IoT compared to Altos. Anyway, so we did the demo in 2019 using like the Thunders board on the Risk Five, integrating that the secure element. And then we, we started use, doing more and more of like the uh, um, things like OTA integration into Risk Five, And then <clears throat> uh, finally, um, we came up with this notion that there was the free autos Risk Five porting in 2021 that you do need relatively large flash memory and RAM in order to run this free autos um, secure connection to a a t AWS using um, root of trust chip and an OTA uh, software upgrade. So uh, we decided that maybe we're going to develop our own risk file that actually has um, supports that the larger memory, which is um, necessary for um, um, various IoT functions like OTA and secure chip integration. So <clears throat> um, in February of 2022, a decision was made to participate in multi-project wafer 5 that Google offers. And then February 26, we decided to create a bunch of wish lists. 
And we find this wish list very important because a lot of times, like Zen's, you know, like that the beginners has got more perception than experts. And uh, so we, we have this like initial thoughts, very important because later on you go back and then fix the project, you know, you use this like wish list. So even though that the engineering wise, that the wish list hardly means anything, but it actually helps later to go back to what you initially intended. But anyway, in March 16th, rocket SOC generation and logic simulation was complete. Uh, by the way, we are using this on Google's, like Google and then DAPA's open road um, chip flow, chip design flow. And um, March 16th, we were able to finish the uh, logic simulation. And the open, lo open logic synthesis job threw an error in the middle. And the reason was, obviously, um, the error was caused by memory deprivation of the PC. So we uh, went out to Akihabara and bought two Intel Mac Mini and then upgraded it to 64K byte, gigabyte RAM. And in March 19th, open lane synthesis completed somehow. Message shows that the tool consumes 35 gigabytes of memory. Due to the scale of logic, the rocket's SOC generator outputs 200 k bytes of logic, two gates of logic, and then an excess of 35 gigabytes of RAM, and then three hours were consumed in order to do this routing. An additional iteration was made to address the hold violations, and each took three hours. Each one took three hours. Open run RAM layout through tons of DCR, DRC errors. And then on March 20th, Slack, open, slash open main, and then GitHub issue communities often. Eh? Uh, sorry, uh, Kawasaki-san. Kawa uh, we are we're, we're having trouble to hear from you. Uh, let me check if I can. Uh, I I will. I will. I will leave the session for just a minute to rejoin the the session to see if we can sort this audio problem. Hi, can you hear me? Eh? Oh, so sorry, uh, um, um, l l let me just uh, hang in here. I uh, will be sharing, I uh, will be doing some quick uh, debugging. I, I can see. I can see that your your voice is coming in actually, but uh, it's probably from my end. So I, I will be keep uh, talking, and I will be keep. Uh, Let me see if I can do anything to just... Kawasaki-san? Uh, I'm thinking that maybe, I, uh, can you use the Skype? Uh, I, 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 I would uh, go, go on another machine to use Skype to talk with... Uh.
hello, hello. Uh, so uh, maybe we can use uh, this kind of uh, hybrid solution that uh, the the, no the 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 voice will come from the Skype, but you can use the Google Meet to share the presentation. Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Then that then we'll do it. Uh, can, can you uh, if you're gonna keep go uh, keep on going your your slides, please. Yeah, I can, I can see your slides okay. okay. So what happened is like we were playing with uh, uh, this uh, free shop. And um, wow, in uh, March of 2017, we finally had a trial on the LR and a lot of help from the way to create the GPS. The design has to go from the check and the date before that the date. That would be five, so we had the six. Three months later. So, what happened is um, we have um, worked on that, but we re regrouped and then decided to design. And then decided to write Chisel for like a QPIPS RAM interface mapped to CPU address space. So, original Sci 5 IP has, can map flash to that uh, CPU address space, but not PS RAM. So we had on May 2nd that we had to pay, you know, like get the PS RAM model from like to simulate the QPI interface. Obtain the model of IoT DRAM, a fancy name for PS RAM with the QPI. The model provided contained ex encrypted very long. So the designer had to move from Icarus very long to model sim Questa to run simulation. And finally, main 29 leverage sci leveraging sci fi E300 chisel code with the original specification. We modified 400 lines of chisel. The engineer only needed to correct the logical description part and then was able to create the SPI interface and map PSRAM to memory. Synthesis and layout was repeated due to the fact that RAM is at the top of 100 lines of very long. It again, had to be manually modified. And in June, second project was modified. So essentially, like that, we use this eFabless Calvo asset, which actually does have a lot of functions to assist you and then create the sandbox. And then we still have many questions. Like, you probably are very interested in asking questions like Chisel versus Verilog. You know, like how Chisel performs compared to Verilog, for instance. And uh, um, also, you probably want to ask things like, how does how does that open road open source EDA tool chain performs against commercial EDA and uh, also external memory um, power simulation can you do power simulation what are we, what are we going to do about um, MPW7 but anyway these are the many of the questions that we still have an answer but anyway uh, one thing that is good is we can evaluate the chip once it's back. So um, for every SOC, we need an evaluation plan. The best way to do it is build the chip in the system and give some role. This, in this specific instance, we gave a current monitoring task to Marmot. Current monitoring, I mean, power current monitoring task to Marmot. Once we receive a chip, we build our SOC into the system. And here's that uh, Mammoth Power Supply Board that actually has got the six power rails and then current measurement output for six 3.3 volt power rails. And uh, we are able to just actually measure current of that, the various parts of the system like this. And also, 
another interesting thing is, particularly like a network Wi-Fi processors, there's no way to check the packets. So the only way that if it is doing okay or if it's not corrupted by malware is to evaluate the, the power waveform. And then this is the, the one area that we are working to just actually figure out what we can do with this type of stuff. And um, um, <clears throat> this is where that I have, where the original data. So like the, the Caravel GitHub, you, you know, like the, the sci five Z5, E310. And then you have Open RAM Chipyard, and then there's a bunch of other things. So, okay, I'll summarize the, the presentation. Essentially, um, Artis consumes less power than Linux, so suitable for energy harvesting IoT. And then another thing is, like as in, the, in, in the, our working, we found out that the root of trust chip integration and security of firmware upgrade takes more memories than we anticipated. And then number three, Majoring chip current is a useful practice. Might be able to detect malware and then hardware implement or cloning of that the system. Number four is we design a custom IP to give the SOC megabytes of flash and RAM map to CPU memory space so that aforementioned memories are actually being supplied. So we leveraged Rocket open source IP, Sky 130 open source PDK, and Open Lane open source EDA tool. And of course, before all that, Risk Five open architecture. So we pretty much, of course, free so free Artos is also open source. Hence, everything is pretty much open source. And we plan to continue SLC efforts on the, the MPW7. So I have to acknowledge that this result was obtained as a result of Secure Open Architecture Fundamental Technology and its AI Edge Applied Research and Development, commissioned by New Energy and then Industrial Technology Development Organization. So that's pretty much my presentation. And uh, if you have any question, I should be able to answer. Thank you very much, Kawasaki. Very thank, thank you very much. And uh, personally, I have a question that uh, there are many open source uh, RISC-V SOCs and uh, cores. So why did you pick uh, the Rocket E31 instead of others? Is there a particular reason for for choosing the E31? So what happens is like that uh, it's very rare that you know E3310 like G003 is just being productized and being sold as a chip. And then its IP is actually also open source. That's very rare, I think. So um, one, you know, like the, the, all the peripheral functions and then everything seems to be working okay because we have been using this platform for like the last three years in, in addition to like a Anders platform for risk five. And then uh, we, we do know that IPs are reliable. That's the reason that I uh, used that uh, um, rocket IP. I if think. that answer the question. Yeah, that's very clear, and I'm, I'm so so inspired as well. Uh, do, so I will be asking the people here if they have any questions. Uh, okay, so most of them are, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of hot in Taiwan now, so people are feeling dizzy, and so I will be, I will do the asking. Uh, so uh, I'm quite wondering that, uh, do you have encounter any kinds of, uh, you know, hiccups on using the open LAN because it is very, it is still in the early stage of the development. And from my understanding that uh, many, uh, you know, the, the, the check, the, the analysis and checks from the commercial tools are not supported in open LAN. So is there any, any, 
arrows or bugs you have encountered and you and you think is very worth sharing with us? So what happens is like, um, as far as I can see, we didn't even see a single DRC error on standard cell. So I, I'm open, I'm in Skype 130 open road. And um, therefore, that the standard cell is very well, well much, very mature, and then all those DRC and then LVS is okay. But on the open RAM, I think it's. I guess that the DRC and the LVS is not mature yet, but it is maturing very quickly because nobody has used the huge like RAM before, but in the like maybe last half a year, everybody is starting to use huge open RAM. So I think it's going to be okay as we, as time goes on. I see. And yeah, thanks very much because uh, uh, a, a bunch of people I know have tried to use open RAM on their own and the open RAM is quite broken for their design. So if thanks for pointing that out, I, we will be very looking forward to the improvements on open RAM and also on the, I'm sorry, uh, let me rephrase it a bit. Will there be a gen, uh, generation two of Marmot SOC or if this will be the last one? Uh, pardon me? Oh, sorry. Uh, it, will, will there be another generation of the M, uh, Marmot, the SOC you have designed? Will there be a generation two? So uh, I guess uh, for us, for us, I think we are planning to just actually run another run, or another generation of Risk Five, and then if possible, we would like to do that the SH two too. I mean, uh, open source some of those like IPs that we have been developing for last years. And uh, if that, is that the am I answering your question? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, sorry, I would, I, I, would, I was asking a very weird question so thank you for clearing things up and I understand c clearly so uh, do we have uh, questions here nope uh, one last question from my end uh, I'm, I'm curious that uh, because you're in collaboration with the UEC which is the Denki uh, Daigaku I think I, I'm pronouncing it right so mm -hmm. is are they trying to uh, engage with the risk five community more or this is just a an, another one shot program no i think that the um, uec has been very advanced it has been doing like a very uh, how should i say ambitious plan like a uh, implementation of risk five and in the past and then uh, separate from us and then together with us so so you know they are really into this risk five right now so yeah thank you very much and yes. thanks for joining us in such, such a short notice i'm very 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 sorry and i'm very happy to have you here so i think that will be the end and arigato gozaimasu thank you very much for your time yeah thank you bye bye so i'll sign off What is this? guy. Oh. 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 Sandian,我超 
First, I just want to thank organizers for accepting my talk and allowing me longer presentation. I would also want to thank Open Source Community for supporting us from the start. In this presentation, I will talk about open source hardware, especially about the FPGA ports, ULX 3S and ULX 4M. So let's get started. Just a little bit about me. I spent most of my working time, around 15 years, on repairs, starting from IT equipment and ending on boundary equipment repair. So I was quite familiar how devices look like from inside and how components are interconnected. That experience took me to the next level of designing and programming industrial IoT devices, mostly different types of smart meters. After that, me, Deborah and Damek from Adivora opened a company called Interdevac that is focused on open source solutions. I am a member of Adivora for around 10 years. It is really a really great place for expanding creativity, to meet people that think on a different way to hang out and do collaboration projects with others. In Ramayona, there is a lot of members from different fields and different skills, like electronics, arts, design. Combining those skills and collaborating, we are creating a really interesting future. As this presentation will be both talk about FPGAs, let me try to oversimplify about FPGAs. So if I have one sentence to describe what FPGA is, I will say something like this. If you can imagine a really big number of programmable switches placed inside the devices, by programming those switches to be on or off, you can get any digital logic. And after, after some time, you will spend in writing AGDL. AGDL is hardware description language. You will notice that it is really similar to like putting chips on the breadboard and connecting them with wires. So with the AGDL, you are not programming like on MCU, you are describing how hardware will look like. And now just a bit of history about ULX3S. ULX3S was developed in 216 as a name of improvement on the of ULX2S that was used in the faculty of electronic engineering in Zara. Dado and Marco agreed on the features every student would need for learning digital logic and Dado started hardware development. At that time, however, I was just helping them with some ideas. ULX 2S design part is designed by Mike Marcos X is looking like this. Design was not available at the moment and the production company that did production for, for a university lost design files at some point. So Marco and Dava agreed that the only solution for a new board is to be open from start, with design files available for everyone. On the ULX 3S, they decided to go with the Lattice ACP5 FPGA chip. Dava put a lot of effort to make board compatible with different ACP5 sizes. On ULX 3S, we can use 12F, 45F, 85F, and with small correction on one power supply, we can also use UM and UM 5G devices. We have discovered that 12F is enough for most of the project, but most sellable device is still 85F. Second part of ULX3S is SDRAM memory. Maximum memory on ULX3S can have 60, is 64 megabytes, but we have only one batch with 64 megabytes. All other batches are 34 megabytes, as that is mostly enough. The idea behind SDRAM over DDR memory was some already done projects like Minimic Oberon Max 1x6 and similar retro projects. At that time, Free FPGA board also had SDRAM, so we wanted to be more compatible. As for the programming, ULX3S can be programmed over US1, USB connector, that is connected directly to FDDI chip. For programming, we are mostly using Fuiproc, that is form of Marcos Edge Fuiproc, but there are also other tools like OpenFPGA Loader. Beside US1 connector, we also have US2 connector that is directly connected to FPGA pins. We can use that connector for USB bootloader, or we can use it as USB host, and has some external devices like keyboard, mouse, or joystick connector. Just in case something goes wrong, what is also programmable over a JTAG connector. 
along with the JTA connector, on top of it there is also a OLED connector placeholder. For a bigger data we have an SD card. We can use it in SDI mode or 4 bit mode. SD card has jet connections between FPGA and ESP32, so devices can talk with the card, of course, not on the same time. On the board, on the board there are also 8 LEDs. 8 was a great number, as we did, we can represent full byte. On FPGA designs, LED are easy way of debugging some internal signals, so you, so you will always need more LEDs. There is no fancy step-by-step -step debugging in FPGA, but you can always assign some signals to LED and check what is happening here. As for the outputs, we also have GPDI. General Purpose Differential Interface that we are mostly using for outputting DVI video signals. HDI monitor, HDMI monitors are mostly compa compatible with DVI signaling, so you can get picture on most monitors or televisions. Next connector can be used for audio or video output. For audio, we are using simple 4-bit resistor divider. On the board, we have seven buttons that are organized like a joystick. So we can play retro games directly on those buttons. Only one button, button zero, has inverted logic and we are mostly using that button for a set. That button can also be used for a powering board on and off. And if one dial is added to the board, we can use that button as a multi-boot jump. So we can jump to our next bit stream in flash. As an input, we also have four deep switches, as, as, as switches are really always useful. Last thing on the top side is a small ADC. It is 12-bit ADC that can have eight single-ended inputs or four differential inputs. Idea behind adding ADC was from Arduino, as users always want to add some external analog devices or just have your potential. On the top, on the bottom side, we have three power supplies. We are using Texas Instrument chip that can provide up to two amps of current. If we are placed UM or UM4G chip, we just need to change one resistor to get 1.2 volts instead of standard 1.2. It can also be used for overclocking. This is just a FPDI chip that is used for FPGA programming but also as a USB to serial interface to FPGA logic. In new version, we have switched to QFM version of the same chip. As FPGA starts, it always starts empty and depending on settings, check for, checks for the bitstream. In our case, bitstream can be placed in flash. In flash, we have 64 megabytes of flash, so something, sometimes we are also using it for other purposes like holding ROM games. One of the special features of the ULX3S is RTC chip that has small memory that can hold power. So we can use this setup to have RTC in, for example, Linux, but the design is also made in a way that RTC can provide big alarm for, for the board. Board can be powered down and on alarm it can wake up. While in power down mode it only consumes 10 microamps. Battery is only to keep RTC time. So you will, need, you will still need to provide 5 volts for the board. Last thing on the back of the board is ESP32. And as the designs of ESP32 changes, we have a footprint design that in that way, so it can hold rover or ROM modules of versions of ESP32. ESP32 arrives with, with preloaded MicroPython and combining the external MCU and FPGAs gives endless possibilities. One of the cool uses of ESP32 is having an OSD overlay on the top of the FPGA picture. So in retro games you can browse SD card and load game, game ROM on the fly. ESP32 also gives this board wireless and Bluetooth, so we can connect to the external, external network on we, or we can use Bluetooth for different things. Once I was using ESP32 to connect to the external, external Bluetooth speaker, 
So I had uh, I had FPGA sound core playing sound on external Bluetooth speaker. And how and here's how current version of the board looks like. A few more things I didn't mention. Oscillator on the board is 25 megahertz. Why? Well, this value is not so important. And you can use as you can use internal PLL to get almost any clock value. We have three more LEDs that are used for serial connection and ESP32 identification. On each side we have 40 pins that are arranged in a way to be PMOD compatible. Out of 56 pins on header, 28 are differential pairs. Small FELO connector is here so we can call ESP32 in reset just in case it takes over the SD card and G5 can be used to switch left bank's voltage to 2.5 volts or we can provide other smaller external voltages like 1.8 volt if needed. On the top right side of the header there is also 5 volt input output so you can provide 5 volt over that connector or use USB and have 5 volt out for external peripheral devices. Just a quick overview of the front side of the board and the back side of the board. Campaign of the ULH board was quite successful and until now we have sold and delivered around 2,000 2, words. Those are really hard, those are real high numbers for a small startup like this. There is only other things I did not mention about this board, so I will show you a campaign video that is showing a lot of interesting projects that are running on this board. Enjoy the minute video while I am having a sip of water. Yes, would never be so popular if offered open tools are not available. So our, our big thanks goes to Yoros HGU team that is making enormous effort in providing open and available tools. Thank you, Yoros HGU. 
So after campaign, we could not sell that amount of work over our maker space. So we have decided to open a company that will handle everything around your experience and be focused on new open source hardware software solutions. We named the company Intergalactic. Once World War produced, we had we, we needed to have some batch testing. We already had internal tests that was good for checking if work is okay. But when you have thousand words at once, you need some scripting. Dominic Zapalonich helped us on this first batch and made our awesome batch script testing. Batch script was great when I was doing it, but once I switched testing to a production company, they were quite lost with those scripts. So I had asked Inbox if they can help us. A month later, I got this fancy GUI tester that any production company can understand. There is a bunch of real XPS examples out there. So we have created, let's call it startup page, that we are refreshing from time to time to include every project we found. And what GitHub is also full of your experience with this. So make sure you check missed examples that are covering all work peripherals. We have also designed a lot of open, open extensions for the new experience. And we are currently selling three of them. First is the USB extension that gives you two additional USB, USB host ports. As for, as, some projects you will need, as for some projects you will need mouse and keyboard. Or even just GPDI can be used for additional GPDI output. It can also be used as GPDI input. We have samples of getting 640 by 480 input, but it may need a bit more work as timings is not automated. So you need to find adjust timings with the balance to get stable picture. With high resolutions also work, but it is harder to get timings right and high resolutions can have more, more noise. The last extension we are selling is for OV camera. You can use it, you can use up to two extensions of one new HDS board. Check other extensions, extensions on my GitHub account. As for our availability of UHDS and extension boards, you can check Crowd Supply, Mouser, or Android site. Or you can contact me directly. I have already mentioned Enos. They have great they have great open source projects. So at some point we decided to collaborate and combine BB3 measuring equipment with UNXPS. We, we did manage to do it, but it was painful to combine EZ MCU board and UNXPS, as any Enos boards was done in Eagle. And UNXPS designs are in Kika. After adding FPGA to NMOX projects, others started to ask the same. So I was thinking, why not make your XTS modular? So everyone can easily put a connector and have FPGA in the system. Your XTS has, to, has too many components for that, and it was big too big for integration. So I have asked the online foundation, will they help me making modular version of the board? And they accepted my offer. So they are financing the development of two modular ports. As making connected fit is not easy, we are also decided to have 3D models first. And Enolet also agreed on financing 3D modeling and experimenting with Blender. All 3D work is done by Power Launcher, also a developer. And here are some pictures from the Blender. Power also need to use Wicked at some point, as there is no easy way of importing geometry, geometry into Blender. You can read more about the Blender progress at intergalactic.eu under news, as we are trying to record our progress in the blog. We have tested different connectors, but at the end we got to a conclusion that connector that is used on Raspberry CM4 model is good enough for everything our board will, our, our board will offer. It is also available and cheap. 
and once we have selected that connector, we got to conclude, we got to a conclusion that we can also be being compatible with CM4 ion. As with, as with compatibility, we will get a big range of the existing CM ion base points. So our first board was SDRAM, and on V02 we managed to squeeze two buttons and four LEDs. Additional to UNXPS, UNX4M will all offer usage of service pin and EPCSI and VSI. On DDR3 prototype, we managed to add one more button and added four more LEDs, as they are so, so important in the public. Also, this version adds two deep switches, and most important, we have added two. We have added USB connector, so we can use this board even without baseboard. For that purpose, we will just need to use the USB bootloader, as USB pins are connected directly to the FPGA. DDR3 board also has a place for the 1 gigabit Ethernet chip. Everything is connected, but we are currently unable to find that chip, so we will need to redesign or wait a bit longer until the chip becomes available. In the way, the next revision and the now version of the board will also have everything that DDR3 board now has. UX4M is now 6 level. There are 3 signal waves, 2 ground planes, and 1 power play level. As I have already mentioned, boards are fully open, and you can check the design at the intergalactic video. As for compatibility, for the moment, we have released the first version of the board. We are getting and buying a lot of already designed IO boards and fixing compatibility issues if they arise. The latest thing we have received is this awesome open hardware tablet that usually holds currently CM4 model, but it can also fit UNX 4 m Currently, we still do not have any sample of driving BP screen, but hopefully at some, at some point we will manage to get something on the screen. So we will give a shout out. This car is from Taiwan. There was a person who was working in Canonical, called Pank. And now he is in QT, which is the QT of QT. He himself likes to work in the evening, and he likes to make these open source things. He also likes to work in the evening. He also likes to work in the evening. He also likes to work in the evening. I don't know if you have seen the evening. There was a person who was recently dead. There was a person who was recently dead. 就很像那种感觉。那其中这台 QD Pi 是他打造，然后我跟就我当我中当个中间桥梁，把这一台寄给这个在克罗埃西亚的，就是讲者。然后克罗埃西亚讲者地址超短的，我跟 Pank 两个看一下，觉得这会不会他给错？然后克罗埃西，然后那位讲者就是这位 Goren， 他克罗埃西亚就说：“哦，没有啦，我们这边其实还蛮乡下的，所以也没几号。”对，然后我就觉得，我真的不好意思，我回来。<laughs> the goal of having completely down to last transistor open Linux with frame buffer is now achieved. Check out how VDR3 is good in Linux or Linux. It's a test, because it's on the FPGA, so it's on the FPGA, and 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 it's on the FPGA. He said because the screen is on the DSI, the DSI has no open source display IP, so he just put the HDMI out outside, and that's his design. So I'm just mounting the FPGA. Now I'm going to mount the Picture to memory, and I'm sending this picture to frame. 就是他，他从那个 GDI 打出来这样。DDR3 version also has enough memory to run simple X system. And for the end, yes, it can also run. 
Thank you. So if you need something, you can contact me on the Jitter or Discord. You can follow up Radiona or Intergalactic EU on the Twitter. And yes, you can send an email on work at intergalactic.eu. And thank you. Oh. 基本上就是这位讲者是一个很有，我发现因为就最后一场，让我稍微打晒一下。这位是我其实我还在念大学吧，大四那年的时候，他们做，他如果他讲他是克罗埃西亚的首府的那个叫萨格列布大学，那他们其实是一个有点类似像算社团这一类的感觉，就是一群其实。因为其实不像台湾人，其实这种就是很很多你十八岁上个大学这件事情其实很稀松平常。可是其实很多国家，其实他们上大学这件事情其实非常非常耗费、所费不赀的。他可能要去国外工作几年，为了念书。对，所以他们其实这些虽然讲说是学生社团，可其实年纪都不见得比我们就是十八岁，然后有些可能三十几岁，我去念大学这样。对，那他们在念大学的时候就觉得，因为。像台湾这种，你可以很轻易的说上网，然后什么易贝，然后 PJ 就买过来，这其实是很在国外，尤其是东欧国家看起来就觉得很莫名其妙的事。那东欧国家他们那个其实你就像最近就就在打仗了嘛，就是那其实是一个，就是其实资源不丰，他们就会想说，那我要自己能不能自己做个 PJ 开发版？然后而且他们也不见得有经费可以去买 s i l e n x 的。那个时候 s 那个年代 s i l e n x 还没有 Webpack， 那个年代 s i l e n x 啊，然后有 Terra 这种都是要。配的那个 EDA 拖圈，所以他们找了一些 Open Source EDA 拖圈，然后自己去勒 PCB 版，然后最后做一张 a p g 开发版出来。然后那时候我在念大学，我写信跟他讲说：“哎、欸，我觉得好有趣，我想要玩一张。”然后那时候那时候还没有，那时候 PayPal 好像很他他他的国家很麻烦。然后最后我还是去银行去办那个 Wire Transfer 去把钱给他，因为 PayPal 他不见得能够收。那我们就千千几百块把那张板子搞过来之后，然后就开始就也是学，就是因为那时候其实在念大学念书的电路，然后就就开始在玩一些那种。那个时候还没有 r e s p i r e 那时候叫 Open r i s k 就是另外一种 architecture， 一个很小的 r e s p i r e 那其实白算盘有个 DEX 的架构，然后拿去改的叫 Open r i s k 这样。然后那时候开始玩说啊 ，Linux 可以布起来，然后可以 porting 这样棒棒这样。Anyway， 然后后来就他到现在是出到第四代，他刚刚讲他从 UX 2 S， 然后3 S， 然后现在4 M。就他其实做到第四代的 A P P 版，然后也是认识很久的老朋友，所以我刚刚讲说，他后来他刚刚就讲一讲说，嗯，我觉得你要挪我时间可以啦，可是我实在后面有事情了，不然我送个音，我就 video 丢给你，你自己播这样，所以就变成这样了。这、就是最后，因为刚刚那位你也刚各位在这在座都知道，那个日本讲者那一段那个实在变动太大，那超出了那个常态的 range， 就变成这样了，对，所以。蛮有趣的，我就觉得，呃，我最后就做个，就这个 track 最后的总结，就是我们虽然说我自己本身也是一间 C P U I P 公司，但其实，在业余时间也好，就业时间也好，其实都有很多这种 open hardware 的 track 跟 community， 在台湾可能没有那么红，那就是在国外其实蛮多的。那也就是如果你想玩 open source 的，不管 E D A 是给 P G 还是给 A C X， 今天都听到了。那甚至连 P C B 版它用 Key Cat， 它是在一个就是随时旁边可能都会爆发战争的国家，它去弄了个 P C B 版出来，为了他们自己的。就是学习跟就是玩，就讲玩乐也是一部分，然后做这样的东西。其实我觉得台湾人要玩这个也很简，也不难。对，那很感谢各位今天陪伴我们这个学到最后，小弟二十一鞠躬，谢谢谢谢。好、哦，感谢感谢，那我就把直播也切。<笑>
一人离十人，就是从是是是，十人手挥到他踢，我全部全部都全部都一个一手包一手包那种大神，现在都在绿光石。OK， 就是因为就这边其实就是开始要就普通普通复刻，原本原本第一套是没有打那场战争，其实考不好年底又要买 PO 了。是是是。然后现在打完，现在自从他叫他 PO 个 P， 对啊对，所以就其实他们为了要开始冲这些 Revenue， 其实就。很多那种比较排名的就看看这边变少，是对，那可是就我觉得看人的选择啊，我个人就觉得就是，我我今年三十几，我想要好好过生活，没有想要再去 r e v o s e 再闯荡一次。对，尤尤其是有一些那种比较年轻的，我我今年没有很大的，就是就是跟那种二十几岁的人就觉得啊，就是感觉就 r e v o s e 玩一玩好了，然后我们这种就会觉得，对对对，就是。所以 r e v o s 的话是是怎么拼啊？呃 ，R I V O S， 他们在台湾其实有招人，然后好的 software 也都有了。只是他们现在这种就是很，就是很 stealth mode 的那种现状，其实都是，呃，不见得会真的有 open position 给你看。就是说，你就写信过去跟他讲说，就是哦，我很想要加入你们公司，他们就会回一封信说，那我们来台湾，不知道哪个咖啡厅喝个咖啡，对对对，大家聊一下，对对对。像沙发这种已经是有点比较就是正规化，就是血啊啦，然后快递啊什么，就是我们，算是反正就现在这种，你们成长的好快啊，对，对，真的真的很快，可是他现在已经变得很官僚，就是我们九月要去外面讲，就我九月其实要去赌博演讲那个我们公司的一些，算就是卡水赌血啦，因为我们也是虽然讲错是开始不太做工，可是还是会有些东西是想要去。第二种 open， 因为有些东西你是架构性的，今天 so open source 的那些 framework 可以但定性而已，后面要动它很难动，所以我们会尽量去想哦。但我们也不是不是恶意，可是就是有些东西 design 上它有 choice， 那我们会想要去 sway 这种，比如说比如说像我是在做克隆这一块，就克隆我现在看你怎么希望这样做，要去 promote 我们的做法。是是是。对，那机票钱。然后老外就说：“你这个不能不求参加就好吗？<笑>你一定要 in flight 吗？”<笑>我就想说：“你们 COVID 都结束了，<笑>我们不能，对<笑>，为什么不能坐飞机？”<笑>然后他就想说：“好了，我们再帮你争取一下。”我现在想，我靠，人家也是要要要要要,要 IPO 了，然后就开始在确认这些东西东看西看的，妈的！<笑>不过我是觉得其实。因为好了，我就老实说，我其实学历不好，我是教大家念到一半，硕班就退学的那种。哦，因为我玩这种东西玩太玩太凶了，就是玩到老板就觉得，你真的有要念硕班吗？你这个还是去外面闯荡好了。然后就，对我后来后来就自主退学了。然后其实后来也是闯荡很久啊，就是一些，稍微稍微我看一下我的可以选，有一些那种其实像四大 IT 公司就不用讲，进不去，就是我们至少去缅缅甸吧，缅甸吧就说。这个可能一六哦，这个助攻而且要签到，算了算了，对，然后然后算了，后来就在小公司打转，比如像金星也是一间很照顾我的公司，是是是，对，就后来就反正人总是有很多换来换去的地方，对，<笑>你们是呃学生吗？还是是哦，所有所有人是哦，学学，学位的，学分位的 ，OK 的，哎，我们还是一直做一爹，你做一爹。<笑>他们是就三三三遇三家的，没有，就新创的，老新创，新创做一点 ，Max 做一点，哦，这么新。然后我我我我开始是在录制啊，我在新华章，然后后来我到台湾。哦哦，新华章我知道那个。了解了解。哦，好奇，我想问一下，就是，我有看到是你们有你们 FPGA 版就是自己做，那那个 PC 版的话，你们是有软体自可以自己画这样。画自己的呀？哎、欸，你是说 PC 版要怎么画吗？对 ，PC 版是有软体，有有有有 K K， 呃 K I C A D， 对，就那个也算 E D 啊，还是什么？它是一种就 P C B 的 E D A 吧，哦、那个那个跟就是我现在的 P J E D A 跟 A C E D A 就是不太一样，但是差差蛮远的，对不对？哎<笑>、欸，所以说教授您也是做这个？对对，我我就有有玩玩了，然后最近最近有有想要碰一下这方面的东西，对，了解了解。我我只是兼任而已的，我自己本身还在做音乐，哦，对对对，了解了解，那那也是老，那我们原本 cos club 其实更重要是、啊，对啊，没错，对对，我在 cos club 的的还蛮蛮多人，对，像像之前总知道小 B 跟我还算熟，对对对，老老朋友了，老朋友了，对对对，好，好我我可能还要再收一下，那就不打扰了，没问题，没问题，谢谢谢谢谢谢，您您可以跟你交换，哦好，没问题。好，没关系，没问题。呃 ，LinkedIn 的部分，我应该要怎么跟你交换会比较好？我跟你说
呃，我我直接开 LinkedIn 好了，然后打您的 ID 这样。Oh. 不过我 LinkedIn 上的资讯有点久没有更新了，我最近因为这<笑>最近这这这几个月其实真的太忙。好事，微信，对，这位吗？对对对。好，没问题，没问题。是做什么发掘